वेरी गुड संडे मॉर्निंग टू वन एंड ऑल ऑफ यू एंड अ वेरी वेरी वॉर्म वेलकम टू आर ए आर सी वेबिनार विच नॉर्मली है स्लॉट बट दिस टाइम we had to do it this way and i'm so thankful that you all gave your precious sunday morning to us and um, i would start off the event and uh, i'm sure there's going to be enormous discussions because the videos are just wonderful and with the uh, great set of expert panel we are sure to do do it great there's going to be a lot of learning which will accrue from it uh, i would like to there is a small change in some of our expert panel because they have uh, otherwise occupied traveling to different conferences so i'll uh, use uh, four of our uh, expert who are going to be here so we have with us dr <coughs> sandeep nagwekar who is a very uh, leading um, uh, ophthalmologist from mumbai has a very premium practice and with a good number of years of uh, uh, practice and wisdom and i'm sure he is going to add huge amount of information to the content of this webinar we have with us dr indra rustagi who is again a uh, truly a great man and he with his all his achievement awards started all over the leader of the haryana state of the almic society who gave us an amazing airs at gurga there are so many things to remember him by besides immensely supportive figure he has been to all of us at airs so i'm sure he would bring in his own set of energies to this webinar joining us any time now would be dr purender basin who is the founder and director of ratan jyoti netralaya uh, which has ophthalmology and is multi specialty practice going in hand in hand and with this uh, ability to uh, handle different uh, sp- uh, sub specialties of healthcare i'm sure he would find uh, helping us in as an expert panel a child's play and uh, they requested uh, dr shreesh kumar because three or four of us expert panel had to suddenly were not there dr shreesh who's our medical superintendent at the i foundation group of hospitals and has been with us for a good number of years and an amazing surgeon with a great clinical acumen and he would be adding his own charm to this webinar and moderating with me is none other but a very charming member arc uh, west a uh, dr anaga harur who is the director of anil eye hospital again a very prolific surgeon and has a own skill sets and she is going to be there to ensure that none of your videos are dissected piecemeal and we get the maximum information for all our delegates without wasting time we shall now go on to our first speaker dr srini are you okay being the first speaker yeah 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 sure yeah. sure So, Dr. Srini again is a chief surgeon and medical director of Com Trust Charitable Eye Hospital at Talaseri Kannur in Kerala, and I, as was already alluded to before the webinar, a uh, extremely forthcoming, positive, smiling uh, figure, and uh, who has great ambitions for uh, Kerala State of Talmic Society and beyond. He is going to be presenting his video. Yeah, uh, is my video visible? Yes. No, not yeah. yet. Yeah. Uh, can you see my video? Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chitra, ma'am, uh, for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Uh, see, uh, we we all uh, uh, see this these sort of cataracts: uh, hypomature cataract, Mogagnan, a white cataract, and uh, this this uh, patient actually came with uh, lens induced glaucoma. Was treated with. Uh, the uh, topical steroids and uh, anti glaucoma medications and was taken up for surgery uh, see uh, as soon as you puncture the anterior capsule you can see all those uh, milky cortex uh, coming out in, in these sort of cases you uh, mostly don't have the risk of uh, uh, this uh, capsule running out to the periphery of the argentinian flag sign because it's 
uh, it's it, though it is really stressed up it's not uh, once once you nick it the food comes out and uh, it is see here you can see uh, that the uh, uh, the same like uh, the capsule uh, when you do the capsular excess, it's, it's it's very floppy. It is it is very loose, and you have to be careful while uh, while doing capsular excess in this in these cases because uh, uh, as you can, the zones are also uh, frequently weak in this case. So what what I did in this case, and I'll, I'll explain uh, why uh, uh, that this was uh, uh, to uh, prolapse the uh, nucleus uh, into the anterior chamber and put the uh, iol into the back. Uh, to create uh, uh, something like a IOL scaffold, which uh, the IOL scaffold, uh, uh, something like the IOL scaffold, which was uh, described first by uh, Dr. Amara Gawal for managing the nucleus in cases with uh, 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 PCRs. So here, why this was done is because it, you saw the anterior capsule so loose. See, the posterior capsule is also extremely loose, and you can't when you do the, the nucleus manipulations in the back. There is all possibility that you'll catch the uh, PC and. Uh, uh, so you you have always that in the back of the mind and you end up doing the uh, uh, surgery in the anterior chamber. Here you have the uh, uh, support of uh, uh, the IOL there. So you try to uh, take the nucleus uh, down uh, to the to the surface of the IOL. Uh, see, it, 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 uh, uh, the maximum attempt uh, should be uh, to take it as far away from the uh, endothelium as possible now it, it is it is actually behind the iris and on the surface of the eye hole and do the uh, the chopping see uh, uh, divide and conquer is out of question the chopping see the the chopping here is, is a bit tricky it it, it it feels funny while doing uh, uh, the chopping uh, uh, procedure like it, it keeps slipping on the uh, anterior surface of the eye hole uh, uh, and uh, but but the advantage is that you can go as far behind uh, uh, as possible from the endothelium. Make sure that you use a lot of uh, uh, dispersive for OVD like uh, viscoid to protect the endothelium. And uh, see what what I do is you ch chip off a bit from the uh, periphery of the nucleus so that it becomes smaller. And then you uh, do a horizontal uh, sort of a chopping. And that see initially. Uh, you do the chopping; it it, it 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 keeps slipping and all. See, once you once you eat up a bit of the uh, periphery, then uh, it becomes quite easy. Uh, keep on uh, injecting uh, visco to protect the endothelium, and uh, definitely the advantage is that you can go as uh, far away from the endothelium as possible. Though uh, you are actually reducing the uh, the space available for uh, phaco emulsification uh, uh, because you, there is an IOL there. Uh, so, so this is it. We can we can discuss on it, and I welcome you all to AOC 2023 Kochi uh, at in Grand Hyatt. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I take an opportunity to do that everywhere. Yeah, I sure should, Srini. Uh, yeah. And uh, thanks for a very wonderful uh, uh, topic which you brought forth for uh, discussion. So I would uh, start asking uh, with Dr. Sandeep. Uh, Sandeep, Dr. Sandeep Nagvikar, yeah. are you there? Yes, yeah. I'm there. So, would you see? You know. Uh, of course, uh, he said, I didn't know when I saw the video, he says it was also a, a phacolytic glaucoma. So mm -hmm. do you feel uh, he must have done probably that an inject, uh, a mannitol injection in these cases would decongest the vitreous and make it an uh, easier surgery? Or would you believe that it is only indicated in a phacomorphic glaucoma? Uh, well, I, I think I would do that. I would probably, because all these patients who have had a uh, lens induced glaucoma, Mm -hmm. It's my normal routine to give them about 200 cc of mannitol pre-op so yeah. that uh, you can decongest the vitreous. We, even if uh, probably it was not necessary, it's always helpful. You don't want a second element coming into play. I yeah. did see a little posterior sinicia before he started the capsulotomy. Mm -hmm. I would have probably released that uh, capsulotomy. Otherwise, Srini is such a wonderfully done surgery and yeah. uh, so many pearls to learn from that. This idea of uh, you know injecting the IOL uh, before uh, doing the fake emulsion, it gives you an extra degree of support in these cases of scaffold. But so, would you want to place a CTR? Because he kept saying, no, the capsule bag is floppy, which is in a hypermature cataract. Yes, Probably yes. the IOL itself with a three piece IOL could have stretched the bag. So yes. maybe the role of a CTR is redundant, but I just mm -hmm. wanted clarity of the expert. Has Dr. Purinder Basin also joined in? Yes, ma'am, he is there. Uh, Dr. Purendra Basin? 
so please unmute yourself yeah. uh, very good morning to everyone i am sorry for joining late um, definitely i will go for with the uh, pre op manitol uh, definitely that gives an edge and uh, some advantage in while during the surgery and uh, these capsular bags are distended and floppy yeah so um, <clears throat> a large sized lens will be better in such cases and um, a three piece lens is a preferred choice and uh, i will go for ctr if he, if i find that uh, there is a, a, a zonal dialysis uh, maybe pre operative or intra operative would you uh, uh, dr shreesh i would ask you supposing you are not putting an iol scaffold in this eye do you see any sense in doing in the bag chopping and if you are going to do a chop it is going to be very slippery as dr srini was telling would you have any any tip to give on that uh, yeah no this is actually uh, is a nice surgery uh, srini and uh, is a difficult case and uh, the floppy bag and uh, uh, there is no cortex as such uh, to support there is no cushion effect and uh, in such cases uh, the ideally uh, uh, what he has done is the right thing uh, placing the lens uh, in the bag and it could have gone ahead with the ctr along with the uh, iol in the bag and then uh, gone ahead with the chopping of uh, uh, lens in the anterior chamber slightly that is supra uh, pupillary area we could have gone ahead and uh, done the chopping so you just catch hold of one equator of the lens that is the nucleus uh, with the high vacuum and uh, high uh, energy the feco power and then you release the power once you are inside the uh, uh, nucleus so you release the uh, power and uh, with the vacuum you hold it with the help of a horizontal chopper you go all the way to the opposite uh, 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 the equator that is 180, 180 degrees away and uh, bring that chopper that is a sharp edge of the uh, horizontal chopper uh, through the substance of the uh, nucleus so that gives a crack and of course it's very difficult actually uh, it it can slip away uh, from your uh, uh, feco probe but uh, this is uh, how it can be done and uh, sweeney has done a good job and uh, uh, that's yeah, how yeah, i think yeah, yeah we can another, go ahead and say yeah would you uh, think of uh, in supposing we were to do it on a laser cataract platform do you think we would just stop with the creating the rexes and not do the fragmentation in this particular case yes absolutely ma'am in these cases uh, flax doesn't work nuclear uh, doesn't uh, work. part will not work yeah. uh, excellent uh, surgery dr srini and uh, as we rightly said in these cases horizontal chop is what <coughs> would be preferred because uh, when you are doing like you said initially even when you are uh, making or trying to get a hold on to the nucleus having a good hold is important especially if there is no scaffold and uh, you can stabilize the nucleus with the left hand either if you have a dialer or a chopper and then a sharp horizontal chop that is the best way because vertical chop because there is no yeah. support should be avoided in all these cases and continuously you should replenish the um, dispersive viscoid <coughs> combination of sodium hyaluronate and chondroitin sulfate because uh, if in this case as you are very anterior damaging the endothelium could these Uh, lenses tend to torque when you are trying to chop so mm -hmm. when you are holding it if the hold is not good then it tends to uh, turn and rotate so it becomes a little difficult but very well done sir yeah so the conclusive yeah. points are that we do the way the feco we how we grip the nucleus and important thing is use a three piece iol as preferably yeah. i think dr sini used a single piece because i think he felt that the bag was uh, the zonules were quite intact and there is now no contradiction to that and probably one case where we will not use an iol scaffold is the last question i have i think we would not use it if it is a dialyzed bag when you feel that the things could be entirely a uh, difficult scenario we would not like to uh, place a three piece iol as a scaffold if primarily when we start i think that would be the only contraindication unless you have anything else to add Manish, I, like that, uh, Manish, I think uh, pre-op use of steroid would also help in such cases. Yes, 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 definitely pre-op use of steroid. Feco like the glaucoma, he did add yeah. that, and uh, and of course injection manitol to decongest the vitreous so that you are a very comfortable uh, surgical thing. 
I think mannitol is even more indicated if it's a phacomorphic glaucoma. So uh, just one tip, madam. I just wanted to share one of my tip, uh, uh. particularly the nuclei of uh, these cataracts where they are very slippery and they keep on moving. They really do not come into the phaco tip. If you make a phaco tip bevel down, mm. then definitely you can catch up these nuclei very, very effectively. Yeah. So yes. that was the only thing I wanted to add. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to add a point. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, I know I've seen your wonderful video. Uh, <laughs> and I wonder whether you're one of the first few to start that. Yes, on to uh, your thoughts. Yeah. We can use uh, the my loop or the snare in such cases after scaffolding in order to reduce the... Don't you think having not having an epinucleus cushion at all and the bag could be so... <laughs> Zonules could be weak. I thought a probable loose bag with a weak zonule might be the only contraindication for a my loop, unless you are an expert in using my loop. No, after scaffolding the intraocular lens, oh, when the okay. nucleus is in the anterior chamber, okay. using the snare or my loop will reduce the uh, ultrasound power. The cornea is much safer. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I want a, that. Oh, yes, that's a valid point. Yes. Uh, the next uh, uh, thing, uh, Dr. Rustagi, I would be taking your question first in this. Um, we would now go on to our next speaker. Do stay with us, Dr. Srini. We need your inputs along the way. We have Dr. Siddharth Narendran, a, a very young dynamic ophthalmologist who's a medical officer of Arvind Eye Care Systems um, based at uh, Coimbatore. And he is going to show us a, a challenging case which opens up a plethora of uh, mm -hmm. discussions. So on to you, Dr. Siddharth. Siddharth, you need to unmute yourself if you yes. have my screen visible, madam. Yeah, it is visible. Ah. So good morning. Thank you, madam. Thank you, ARC, for this opportunity. So I'll be presenting two scenarios of cataract in uh, colobomatous eyes. In one, I prefer FACO or in the other SICS over FACO. So this is the first patient with microconia iris coloboma cataract in a relatively small pupil. So I initiate and capsular rexus with the cystitome. So we can actually see that the rexus is very small. We still uh, try to proceed with the fake emulsification. Um, but I'm concerned that my video, video, video is not moving. As well as voice is also breaking. Not able to listen. Is it moving now, sir? No, no. no. Uh, so, so uh, Dr. Sudha just stop. I, I think I, we, have to, we have to go out of this and uh, share screen again. Uh, Dr. Oh, Ashwara, I think. Dr. Ashwara wants his video to be played from your end, Mr. Sunil. Yes, now Siddha. Just opening. Just opening. Just opening. Uh, Dr. Dr. Siddharth, you are uh, there. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Siddharth, can you start? It's stuck. Why is it stuck? Uh, again, Mr. Again, Sunil, not moving. Mr. Sunil, you are playing the Please video. Play on the yeah, it's moving okay. now. It's opening. It's opening up. Yeah, go ahead. Siddharth, start. Yeah, I, I'm not able to see the video. You're not able to see the video? No, no, no. It is visible now. I think. One minute, Siddharth, we'll wait. It's not visible. Please stop your video. Vidya, Siddharth, you're not able to see the screen? Siddharth, oh, I, yeah. Yeah. No, I not able to see. Okay, then, uh, Mr. Sunil, can you Maybe. go back so that? I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, connectivity is poor. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I think video. there is a problem um, with the. I'm, not, yeah. I'm, I'm able to see. I'm able to see now. Yes. Siddharth, you switch off your video. Your network is network is weak. If your video is off, maybe then uh, we can see your video and we can hear you. You switch off your video, Siddharth. 
or somebody can play from our side sunil mr sunil ma'am no, i'm playing okay yeah. i am playing from the start yeah, yeah. dr siddharth yeah. can give the voice over from yeah. there yes ma'am So good morning, and I thank ARC and Madam for this opportunity. So I'll be presenting uh, two scenarios of cataract in cholabamatosis. In one, I prefer FACO or SICS, and in the other, SICS or FACO. So this is the first patient with uh, microcornea, iris coloboma, and grade one to two cataract in a relatively small pupil. So I initiate and complete capsular excess with a cystitome. Doctor, so, so we can see that the excess is uh, very small. Next, uh, so I try to proceed with FACO, but I become concerned that I may injure the anterior lens capsule. So I use high risk hooks to expand the pupil. I take care not to hook the excess margin here, as the aim is to expand the pupil and not to support the capsular bag. So once I visualize the anterior lens capsule, I proceed with FACO. So it's a soft cataract. I just divide it into two halves and emulsify the nuclear bits. So during FACO and IA, I consciously avoid turning my FACO tip towards the coloboma region to avoid inducing or expanding uh, any pre-existing zonular laxity. So now I proceed with uh, aspirating the epinucleus. So after uh, epinucleus removal, I then proceed to do a cortex uh, aspiration with the coaxial IA tip. So now we see that the rexus is very small. So then I enlarge the rexus with the capsular forceps. Once I'm convinced the rexus is of adequate size, in this patient, I, we had to place a three-piece uh, rigid intraocular lens. So I make a small sclerocornial tunnel and uh, implant a three-piece intraocular lens into the capsular bag after releasing the iris hooks. So this is the second patient. It's a black brown cataract with iris coloboma. The difference is this patient had an associated lenticular coloboma. So here again, I prefer uh, SICS over FACO. So a large sclerocornial tunnel is fashioned. Uh, a side port is made and trypan glue is injected. I direct the dye away from the coloboma site to prevent dye migration into the vitreous cavity, which would impair visualization during later parts of the surgery. Then uh, anterior chamber entry and extension is done. After ensuring proper size, I initiate uh, the excess with the cystitome. Always at the site of the coloboma, I shift to a capsular forceps and complete. The aim of hydro dissection here is only to mobilize. In cases such as these with weak zonal weakness, I prefer bimanual nucleus delivery. I use the spatula as a fulcrum and dial the nucleus into the anterior chamber with the Sinsky hook. Once the nucleus is brought into the anterior chamber, we see it's a hard brown to black nucleus. I deliver it using irrigating forceps. Being a hard cataract, uh, luckily there's very minimal cortex, which I remove using an irrigating Simcoe cannula. And then, so this patient had an associated lenticular coloboma. So I place a CTR, I implant a CTR into the capsular bag. And a three-piece intraocular, rigid intraocular lens is also injected into, is implanted into the capsular bag. So even though it's a large tunnel, if a properly constructed tunnel, no seat sutures are required, and the anterior chamber forms well without any sutures, and the uh, conjunctive apparatus is cauterized. So thank you, thank you, madam. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful video, Siddharth. That is uh, extremely good. So I'll take the first question with Dr. Vistagi. Uh, yes. Do you feel, Dr. Ustagi, uh, he has used iris hooks in the first case, but do you think because the pupil was uh, uh, drawn, yes, could you have uh, used the iris hook even before he placed the rexus, even before he did the rexus, so you could have got a larger rexus? Yes, yes that, that is what uh, I was trying to emphasize, yeah. that uh, before doing CCC, uh, he must have used, uh, you know, pupillary dilating device, whatsoever yeah. it is. Yeah. And uh, that could have uh, helped him achieved in a larger CCC. 
and yeah. a better yeah. surgery better surgery for that yeah and, and uh, yes another another thing is that uh, he must use uh, you know uh, this thing uh, excessive uh, visco use that that again uh, was uh, the point of importance mm-hmm. and he is uh, you know emphasized upon the use of uh, sics surgery that is good that in such cases uh, sics is always the alternative yeah yeah more so if it is a very hard cataract but i have that one other question later i would discuss that uh, dr uh, sandeep i would want you to answer me this would do you think that it is important to place a ctr as early as possible when the, if there is a coloboma keeping in mind that there is a chance of fluid misdirection which can occur in this area of zonular weakness dr uh, yes sandeep, of course Yes, yes, of course. Uh, so, uh, you know, regarding the second case, just uh, regarding the second case, I think the CTR was placed at the right time. It's yeah. probably difficult to uh, do the SICS with the CTR in the bag. In fact, it's difficult at that time. So that was okay. But uh, maybe whenever there is any doubt that there is likelihood of, uh, you know, vitreous prolapse or loss of lens material through the coloboma, it's probably better to stretch the bag out. Though... rarely have i used it in cases of coloboma most of the time somehow uh, it yeah. has been okay i But, would believe that we should even plug that area of uh, your in- oh my internet connection is weak huh? okay can you all hear me yes, yeah, yes. i i would all i think our internet connection is weak so just one question dr nagvikar when you were mentioning that we rarely use ctr in case of coloboma so it is only in that localized area that probably there would be a deficiency of zonules and rest of the zonules are really very good yes. so there is not even any pachydermosis so yes. i would like to ask the panelists whether it is actually mandatory to put in a ctr yes. in these cases you know if there is no other zonular uh, if you can hear me anagha can we come back yes yeah. what i feel is a ctr is indicated because fluid dismiss direction we are not talking of the lax bag going off fluid misdirection is a possibility in the colobomatous area in fact besides the ctr you should even plug that area with little visco elastic so that you push back a probable uh, any imagined vitreous in that particular area and also prevent fluid from going in through that area and then making it a very shallow ac so the role of a ctr or or visco elastic being put to plug that area is essentially to avoid fluid misdirection and also there could be an asymmetric bag contracture in the post operative period so the ctr would keep the bag circularized so you do not have an asymmetric contracture so those are the reasons for asking for a ctr i mean most capable surgeons can deal with that uh, uh, zonular weakness you can get away without doing a ctr my concern was that that is why i'm sure it's open to discussion with the other expert panelists whether they differ in their thoughts and even anagha can voice her thoughts yeah dr basin sir your thoughts on it well i usually don't use ctr in all these cases because that area of zonular dialysis is not much and i will definitely plug it with uh, the viscoat and uh, cover that area with viscoat and uh, and uh, endothelium also is covered that way and protected so that is what i do in majority of the uh, coloboma cases i don't require ctr i go away without it one thing um, um, can i make, make some comment on the yes. yeah I, i will definitely appreciate both the cases have been managed very nicely and they have he has shown uh, two variety of cases yeah and uh, one is soft cataract and all these coloboma cases what my experience is they are these patient although they are young but their nucleus is very hard they are yeah. having a dense um, grade 3 grade 4 grade 5 cataracts so that is what it is and <clears throat> second case i have seen that he has managed it beautifully with sics if you are good in sics and a large tunnel has been created that is very much required mandatory in these cases i will uh, prefer um, enlarging the incision after doing the capsular access 
what uh, what has been shown is that uh, we have enlarged the section to 10 millimeter or 11 millimeter tunnel and then we are doing scapular axis so in that condition chances of shallowing of the anterior chamber and extension of the capsular axis is very high yes. um, although he has beautifully done it we are out of the experience he has done and uh, secondly in the first case uh, i will prefer to use uh, iris hooks uh, uh, early uh, early and lastly lastly um, in the first case because the cataract is was soft so uh, he has preferably used i think sinski hook that is what uh, i use either sinski hook or uh, in soft cataracts or a um, iris repositor i think with a chopper kind of with a long tunnel the chances of damage to the posterior capsule are high the excellent yes, point you have brought out dr purendra was in wonderful points but one other thing is uh, the some of these eyes with microcornea would have a quite a shallow anterior chamber the the lens size is disproportionate to the size of the anterior chamber so getting the lens out of the bag into the ac also needs uh, some uh, care care and expertise he has done a bimanual approach about uh, removing it yes. that is what is required i think bimanual approach I mean, leveraging as well as uh, protect uh, the bringing out the equator of the lens from one end. That is very, very important. We have to tear lever it and we have to uh, bring out one of the and our capsular axis should be of sufficient size. Yeah. You have rightly pointed out because these cases, the size of cornea is also small. Yeah. Associated uh, corneal diameter is also small in many of these cases. But beautifully managed both the cases. Anaga, you have something to tell? Yeah, yeah. Just lovely surgeries in case of the SICS case. It yeah. was a very good decision because in such a hard brown, blackish cataract, they could have taken a lot of energy and corneal uh, decompensation risk would be very high. And for an SICS, larger CCC and if at all, it is better also to make NICs, yes. multiple NICs because it's very possible otherwise that if the excess is slightly small, when you're trying to bring out the nucleus, it, there can be a irregular tear which can go into the posterior yes. capsule. Yes. So better to make nick so that it is easier and you have a yes. stable back. And the last oh, point is one. when you place a three-piece IOL in these bags, place the haptic in the direction of uh, the coloboma so that it also stretches the bag in case you have not placed the CTR. Just one question. Why was a rigid lens put in the first case? Because then you have to extend the incision if I uh, remember. Uh, that yeah. was I, cost effective. I think that package must be that. Uh, in, yeah, that that's right. Cha charity patient. Okay. Yes. 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 Yeah. My, my, my question is, is this, uh, Dr. Siddharth. Uh, nicely done surgery. The first case is a soft lens, uh, soft cataract. Uh, I would prefer uh, a CTR in these cases. Like if you are doing a FACO, there is a, a chance of uh, fluid misdirection and uh, uh, causing a secondary glaucoma. Um, but in case of uh, uh, the hard cataract, the, like the second one, where the nucleus is very uh, big and uh, uh, the rex, making a rexis, a large rexis itself is difficult in these cases because the area where the coloboma is there, the inferior inferior nasal area is actually fragile. Uh, yeah. To make a large rexis in this area may be a little difficult, but uh, he has done it beautifully and uh, has yeah. come out beautifully. And uh, the fluid uh, uh, management like uh, in the SACS is much less as compared yes. to FACO. Yes. So the fluid misdirection and so the chances of uh, misdirection yes. is less in yes. the SACS as compared to uh, FACO. Yes, yes. You're very good. Rustagi, Dr. Rustagi? Yeah. You've covered uh, it. I, anything, Trent? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, I think these patients are young and, uh, you know, uh, visual outcome is the ultimate uh, yes. goal. Yes. But uh, in the second case, I think uh, 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 the other panelists would, uh, you know, uh, highlight this. The role of pupillary cosmosis. Is there any role of pupillary cosmosis? Pupil, uh, why in the second thing? Yeah. Yeah. Coloboma, pupillary coloboma there. Pupillary. I think there's some amount of uh, neuro adaptation that must have occurred in these uh, patients because right from the birth, they have had that coloboma. So I don't think that would be a, much of a visual handicap. Most for us, for our own surgical satisfaction, we could do it. Thank you very much. Uh, that was wonderful. And Siddha, that was an amazing video you brought for us. And there is going to be a small change in the schedule. Very sorry, Dr. Nichani, but Saurabh has to go for some meeting. 
So okay. Saurabh Rutra would be uh, presenting his uh, video. Um, Saurabh, are you there? Yes, yes. yes. Yeah, so Saurabh is an um, uh, extremely uh, prolific uh, uh, surgeon. Saurabh, you are also a vitreo? No, okay. And um, oh. he, he is from uh, one of the major heroes of uh, Chhattisgarh uh, uh, ophthalmic society. They have a lot of energy and you can see him all over the country participating in innumerable uh, conferences and talks. So let's hear what he has to tell about his particular video. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for such kind words and good morning, everyone. Thanks, ARC, for giving this opportunity. So I'm going to be keeping it a little basic so that, you know, uh, this is going to be a hard cataract case, uh, a fakeable case, uh, wherein what basic steps, uh, what I follow so that my patients are good and I, I get good results. And of course, I'll get to know from all of you what better I can do on this. So it's it was a case of uh, NS4+. Plus. I usually make, I'm a coaxial phaco surgeon, so I make two entries. I usually make my side port with a 26 gauge needle. And, you know, I stain all my capsules so that there's there's no chances of losing my time. And uh, I usually make a partial thickness uh, entry first and uh, go for my uh, uh, cleaning of the AC. And then, you know, I use my cystitone to go ahead and do my rexis. So in a case like this, I am planning or I have targeted to have a little bigger rexis because it's a hard brown cataract. So, and I here use a prefix, pre-filled visco uh, in my needle. So here I've pushed little more visco so that before, you know, it, the AC gets flat, I again, you know, form my AC from by the other hand and then again go ahead and, you know, complete my rexis so that I don't have to really come out. So this can be a small tip which I have been following from quite some time for the initial practitioners or the guys who are still, you know, getting into FACOs. So now I've done my rexis, complete my incision. I use a 2.4 blade, especially after using this Centurion. I'm happily uh, using a 2.4 incision because all my lenses go comfortably through it. So uh, very careful and a complete pyro. Careful because, you know, uh, in cases like this, there can be, you know, uh, the zonule weakness can be expected. So once you are sure enough, uh, I found my AC with a lot of viscoat here. So I somehow missed that. And then uh, I'm a compulsive stop and chop guy. I'm going a little high in real time here so that, you know, I'm just trying to go as deep as possible for my tunnel and keeping a track of my FACO power and uh, taking care best of the care for my cornea. So once I'm sure enough, I've had a good reflex. I attempt my first crack. Once I've rotated it completely, I tend to go a little more deep. So here is my first crack. So uh, a good tip would here would be having a full completely cracked nuclei because you know otherwise the, the posterior plate is very very uh, elastic and it gets difficult if you haven't had the proper break. So herein I thought there is a little more uh, trenching required and then I you know complete my crack. So once this is done uh, the game gets a little more comfortable but yes uh, I make small pieces so that again in these pieces also you have to have a very good and a complete crack so that you know it doesn't get attached to the posterior plate and piece by piece you can take them off and once you feel that uh, you know there is a requirement to uh, fill the uh, ac with some more of chondritin sulfate and uh, uh, sodium halonate so you probably go ahead and put some more visco to it i finish the half part of it it has completely come out i come back put another some more of visco and hpmc so that you know uh, I have a good crystal clear cornea at the end of uh, the day. So, but herein I would uh, want my seniors to comment somehow in, in this particular case and in couple of cases, uh, I tend to lose my grip. I don't know why. I am not able to chop here that well, but yes, I know it's been, I've been doing here. I have to dance with the whole nucleus wherein I am definitely using more power. So I don't know what, what goes wrong in such hard cases in my hand that, you know, the first half I get, I can crack it very completely and comfortably and the other half, you know, I tend to miss those complete cracks wherein I have to probably bring my nucleus a little up because uh, at times patient also tends to get a little more uh, uncomfortable with more uh, uh, taken time. So this, in this, I almost took 12, 12 to 12 and a half minutes to complete the case. So herein, uh, we have to so everything in four minutes. So I just concentrated on the part wherein I wanted to make some points and probably 
gain something from uh, uh, the respected panel here so was, the, thank you yeah that was a well discussed uh, video saurabh i mean what of uh, important points you brought forth for uh, discussion here uh, i would want uh, expert panel let me start with uh, dr nagvikar uh, now he has made an optimal size rexes but um, uh, do you believe that these kind of hard cataracts should only be done with a horizontal or a vertical chop and you should not use a stop and chop or do you believe that some of these dense cataracts when the posterior plate is very hard to crack you could even adopt a divide and conquer method whichever bails you out faster or do you feel that those procedures would be uh, would not be zonula friendly what do you say dr sandeep i would want yeah. dr kurendra vasin's thoughts on it yeah so now i think it was a well done case uh, yeah. first to answer uh, you know his query regarding why he finds it difficult to do the second half yeah so when you're adopting a stop and chop uh, saurabh the uh, first thing that you must try to do is after you've achieved the crack you must try to crack the nucleus completely make all the pieces what you did was basically did a, a hemi nuclear management and then you try to crack when the bag was completely you know open it is easier to crack in a stop and chop when the bag is full so therefore it is better that you do the stop and chop and then proceed to divide and make as many pieces as possible before you start emulsification so that will bail you out of the problem and to come to sorry also i do feel sometimes because these nuclei are very hard to crack mm -hmm. and you might even have to do a multi level chopping kind of thing like yes. one slice yes. it may not happen and at yes. that time if you lose purchase on the nucleus then it becomes an ineffectual chop so right. you have to keep seeing that you get purchase on the nucleus each time and be prepared that it may not come in one go you might yes. have to do a multi level chopping too so to achieve a good hold you must use high vacuum and before that use high power as well because you need to get it into the nucleus and nothing is going to crack unless you're going to have a good hold while you might escape off in a soft and a moderately dense nucleus in a hard nucleus it's uh, important to get a good vacuum and now to come to uh, chitra's query regarding the preferred chopping technique uh, what i prefer to do is to make a small trench so that i get a good hold and then i proceed to as far as possible a total chop and i prefer a horizontal chop because i am able to go right up to the equator but that doesn't mean that a vertical chop cannot be done a vertical chop can be done as uh, far as the vertical chop is concerned i think it is a little more difficult a little more tricky but uh, yes the essence of the game in chopping in nuclear management is to have a good hold so you shouldn't proceed with chopping unless you've got a good hold on the nucleus and uh, for that i think you need a little power be able to dig the peco into the nucleus hold it well then it doesn't matter whichever chop you use you should be able to do it quite nicely dr basin <clears throat> i think uh, dr uh, saurav has done a, a, a brought about a very good case and uh, sandeep uh, has really uh, brought out all the points and elaborated uh, i think nothing more to be added over here dr yes, sir no the singh want to say something dr singh yes. wants to say something yes yes sir dr arvind singh yes sir yeah 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 okay see two things i would like to discuss here the first that uh, when you are doing a trench in this what i generally do i first make a superior trench a nice deep up to 80 to 90% depth rotate it 180 degrees bring the inferior half superior and then again trench it so that you can have a nice complete divide of this nucleus so this is one point and again as i said there was difficult to it took him 12 and a half minutes to chop it and it was taking time i was seeing his side port was very close to the main port if you push it little at about the uh, 30 degrees more away you get a wider space to move your second hand because if your second instrument working nicely and feeding the you know your uh, nucleus segment it will make the surgery much faster with the higher vacuum and the less seco energy dr rustagi you have to say anything Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Saurabh has, you know, taken this uh, case knowingly for the beginners and all that. They start with this kind of the trench and go safely. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, as you were saying that uh, 
complete stop and chop uh, choppers are there but they are you know only the expert can use that so uh, dr saurav has rightly uh, taken this case for the beginner that you have to be safe ultimate uh, you know ultimate outcome is to give the safe outcome what is it which causes uh, cornea to uh, lose its clarity anaga you could if you wanted to ask something i want to ask you do you think it is a chatter of the nuclear fragment or do you think it is a using of high phaco energy or the duration of phaco which do you think is actually hampering i mean creating the corneal haze in the next day post op uh, ma'am i feel you know more than anything it is the length of the surgery is so, as long as you are protecting the corneal endothelium you are away from the endothelium yes. and see time manually when you are making so many times you will have to go very slow in it so don't worry about being in 12 minutes it's what how much what you are doing in those 12 minutes is important yeah see, doing it in 4 minutes and then damaging the endothelium we are not going to achieve anything yeah. so the damage to the corneal endothelium will basically occur because of the use of higher power higher energy so use of burst mode and uh, you know using the on off you have to optimize right, your sir. phaco dynamics in such a way that the minimal possible phaco energy should be used yeah. and secondly very very gentle movement because many times here because there is no epinucleus less of cortical cushion so there is directly the pc so any kind of jerky movement during the chopping can damage the zonules also regarding as to which uh, type of chopping mechanism me- method to use i think whatever works best in your hands yes. it, there is no hard and fast rule that you should not use chop and chop or you should not use divide and conquer yes. only thing in divide and conquer obviously a larger amount of energy is going to be used but yes. as long as you are comfortable sometimes you can start with a you know direct chop like sir said make a small trench and start but if you feel that there is a torque and it is not chopping then you can convert to a stop and chop doesn't matter yes as long as you have a good final visual outcome yes wonderful wonderful i wanted that to be conveyed one last question this wound burn sometimes can occur when you are especially when you are started with the high energy phaco you are started so can you any of you tell me how do you avoid a wound burn what is the possibility of the wound burn occurring with the modern machine rarely which happens Yes, Doctor Basi. I think um, when the tip uh, gets clogged and you miss it, you don't uh, understand that tip has got clogged and it is not purchasing and it is not doing. Uh, that is the point. In the modern machines, I think that is the one way I, we should early detect it and stop doing phaco and clean the tip. Yeah, more yeah. important. Most it's often, it's uh, visco elastic. Yeah, yeah visco elastic. <laughs> that that is true. Much of visco in that. So you should go in. So as visco. Well, uh, uh, you should go in with the fluid on. You enter so that disperses the visco elastic. <laughs> dissolves it. it. Dissolves the visco elastic dilute. It, it, it didn't uh, uh, normally What's happen with point? HTMC. Uh, uh, it's it's yes. it's more with. Uh, uh viscot and all it, it it gets you go oh, with the uh, um, aspiration and it yes. it gets clogged in it and uh, that, yes. uh, then then it, everything happens yes. Yes. i think it happens more with viscot viscot yeah. yeah no no what all the points are very well discussed and i would want the message to be sent to all the uh, people who are watching that whether you do a stop and chop or divide and conquer as long as you're going to protect the cornea the zonules and as long as you're skilled i think whatever works best in your hands work it and you could get very clear corneas the next day doing the right way and um, uh, excuse me ma'am i just i want to add one more point to this why this uh, wound burn is there sometimes yeah. we we are tackling a hard nucleus yeah. and our port size is less like suppose i am doing a mics with grade 4 nucleus process yeah. in that case if my phaco time is longer in that case this uh, this phaco tip gets stuck in this uh, small wound and that is the uh, reason for the wound burn also yes so yes. the heat production is there and that's yes we yes. prefer a 2.8 rather than a 2.2 yeah. in these cases yes. okay. yeah. i think point is the right wound is also one of the reasons yes. for uh, wound burn yes. Yes, and uh, the corneal clarity. Uh, Dr. Chitra asked this question actually uh, how to maintain corneal clarity. So you can make multiple uh, segments, like uh, instead of four segments, yeah, quadrants. You can make multiple segments, maybe seven or eight pieces, and uh, uh, emulsify them. 
in the bag try to emulsify them in the bag so definitely you can avoid coronal uh, uh, damage yes wonderful yes. wonderful discussion we shall now go on to our next speaker dr parul chavla who is assistant professor uh, at pgi chandigarh and again a very prolific surgeon and she is actually going to show us a very challenging video on to you dr parul what is happening dr parul your mr sunil can you connect her video we are losing time actually like that uh dr parul please stop your presentation i'll i'll start i'll okay open. you be ready sunil i think many videos might need your help let us not delay so today i'll be uh, presenting a case of a subluxated lens in a pediatric patient so she was a 3 years old female who uh, we had operated the right eye for subluxation and we had to operate the left eye so i'll just be describing the general physical examination she had an increased arm span and high arc palate a pectus carinatum kyphoscoliosis she had all the positive hand signs and she had pes planus and on uh, echocardiography she was diagnosed as a marfan syndrome so we planned a, a single piece iwl in this patient so initially the localized conjunctival peritomy was done we cauterized the bleeders we made a partial thickness scleral flap then we created the side ports using 15 degree knives we injected the hpnc 2% that is methyl cellulose we made the main port we started with the uh, capsular excess using a cystitome and completed it with a utratus forceps and the important point is to center the capsular excess on the lens rather than centering it on the corneal center or the pupillary center then we did general hydro dissection and with bimanual irrigation aspiration we aspirated the whole cortical matter then we marked around 2 mm from the limbus and we we loaded the nano polypropylene suture we used a single eyelet suni that was 12 by 10 mm depending this depends on the axial length as well as the wide to wide diameter so that is how we make the choice of the sunis and then we dialed the suni single eyelet suni into the bag very carefully this suni single eyelet was uh, dialed exactly into the place of the subluxation and we uh, tied a, uh, the pair pack suture that is a nano polypropylene just sufficiently to stretch the bag and we implanted a single piece hydrophobic acrylic iwl into the bag then we titrated and fixed the knot and sutured the main port with teno nylon then we aspirated the viscoelastic gently and uh, sutured the flap as well as the conjunctiva then we hydrated the side ports this was the post op day 3 picture showing an absolutely central iwl and the asost picture showing a completely parallel iwl to the iris plane that was a wonderful video dr parul and you made it appear so easy and simple i'm sure a lot of skill sets is required for this uh, yeah uh, i would take the first question with uh, uh, dr basim um, do you think uh, it was such an elastic capsule you noticed she did not use any counter traction yes. at all when you're doing it would you think of course she did it very well and she centered it beautifully on the lens uh would you what would you do anything different than the way she did it in that step uh parul uh, she has shown a very beautifully managed case but i will differ at a couple of places yeah. one is that uh, uh, doing a capsular access in 
such a case, I will prefer using a micro capsular access forceps through the side port because uh, then uh, the chances of leakage of the anterior chamber is less and uh, you have better control in doing it. And uh, these capsules are very lax. They are relaxed kinds of, kind of bags because they don't have any trampoline effect of the zonules at the rest of the area where the zonal dialysis is there. So in this case condition, you, you have to pull it rather the capsule and then complete it. And uh, forceps is very good. Now, second thing is that I will not prefer doing um, um, a FACO or a, a irrigation aspiration of the cortex first. Rather, I will try to, I would like to fix the bag first and uh, cover the, uh, the area of uh, the bare vitreous and uh, then bring it, bring the, uh, the capsule, uh, the whole bag to the, to the place where it has to be. And then I will do irrigation aspiration. And first I will place a Sioni ring. That's what my this thing is. Otherwise, Why couldn't you have used capsular hooks and uh, centered yeah. the bag? You could have used the hooks. And so that, all, yeah, that is one thing, thing which I usually do. And nucleus management can get challenging, of course. And it's a very soft uh, nucleus, which just needed FACO aspiration. So... I my thoughts were supposing capsule re retractors are specially designed to be placed in these cases, and two or three capsule retractors will definitely stabilize the bag. So my this thing is that we should stabilize the bag first and then do phaco method. Yeah, Doctor yeah. Rustagi, do you yeah. think that instead of a Sioni ring, one could just place a CTR and CTS nowadays that we have good CTS? Because placing a CNE ring, it becomes quite bulky in these very young eyes, and uh, yeah, that that would have that would have definitely served the purpose. And uh, yeah, uh, yes, and uh, the other thing, Anaga, or Anaga yeah. or Doctor Sandeep, anybody could tell me what would be the extra tips which you would advise when you do flats in a subluxated eye. Ma'am, flats in. Uh, has been really proven to be excellent in these cases because then see in all the subluxation this extreme subluxation uh, this is extreme and because it was a 3 year old girl anyway i don't think we would have been able to do flax yeah. but if it was a traumatic subluxation for example in an adult yeah. definitely flax would work well because then you have a perfect rexus so yeah. the basic uh, the most critical point i feel in a subluxated cataract is the rexus yeah. because then only you can put in a ctr otherwise your chance of putting a ctr is gone yeah. If at all your excess goes to the periphery, then I think the entire management will change. Yeah. So uh, it is very, very important to have a perfect rexis. So flax definitely works very well. But obviously in very young patients, uh, we will not be able to uh, do flax. Actually, Parul, your video was impeccable. But we need to dissect everything so that a lot more understanding comes out of it. And that's why we brought up these questions. And Can I say something? Yes, yes, yes Dr. Uh, Sandeep. Yeah, yes. yeah. So I think the most critical thing which uh, beginners, the biggest challenge that they face is doing the capsular access. Yes. And while Dr. Parul is an excellent surgeon and she did a very good job, one of two small tips is most of these cases of Marfan syndrome have yeah. high amount of posterior segment complications. So you have to make sure that the vitreous station is okay. I've yeah. seen sometimes even in a young Marfan's when doing, the vitreous has presented in the anterior chamber. Mm -hmm. So it's probably better to uh, make sure that there is no vitreous by injecting a little triamcinolone first and making sure that there is no vitreous, even in these, of course, your patient was only three years old. So the high ch uh, chances that the vitreous station was bad. Number two, while doing the rexis, sometimes, you know, when you come to the area of zonular weakness, it is very difficult to complete the capsular rexis, even if you are holding with forceps, because there is no counter-attraction from the zonules. One useful tip which I'd like to give people is that maybe sometimes, you know, I make some small side port to put in a second instrument to stabilize the cut portion of the capsule. And then with the other forceps, I, I complete the rexis. So, uh, you know, it's very important to get traction, which you don't get in these cases. So maybe this might help, you know. Capsule yeah. hooks would have also helped. Uh, ca yeah, capsule hooks. Capsule hooks, yes. Mm. Something to stabilize the bag when you are proceeding ahead with this. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, just one point is these yeah. are patients who are young and this is a progressive, you know, uh, condition. It's so fine. how many patients like this have we seen that the entire bag, even later on also, uh, has shown any kind of dialysis or whether it is better to just do a 
uh, you know, posteriorly uh, lens yeah, aspiration yeah. and lensectomy yeah. and then put in a uh, SFI oil yeah. in these cases. Yeah. yeah. Recently, so, I had a family. Recently, mm. in just last couple of weeks, I had a family where the mother and his daughter and his her daughter is autosomal dominant and they presented me with the markings with the so the mother presented with the complete dislocation with the uh, lens was captured into the anterior segment in the AC and with the glaucoma, right pressure. So I had to do the emergency lens segment into that with the vitrectomy and then I did the SFI well. After in the post-op, she told me that her daughter is also suffering. She was 22 years old. And I found her, she has almost 270 degrees of luxation in the classical Marfan family. So again, instead of going for the this technique, I prefer to do the complete lens technique. And I didn't disturb the anterior phase of it and did the SFI in that case. So yes, do some of the cases. Later on, they do develop the complete uh, zonal dialysis. And I have seen in the past uh, being a vitreous surgeon, and uh, the patient has been with the complete dislocation with the IOL with the, with the complete with the bag. So that is a strong possibility. Later yeah. on, the remainder of the journals they give up, and the lens completely dislocate into the vitreous. The only thing is when you don't do a lens to me, you know, you are not invading the posterior segment. If you have no yeah. disturbance and you have done a good surgery, you can get away. In such cases, my preferred tip is if the best corrected vision with the spectacles is good, hurry up the surgery. Try to delay it as long as possible. Okay. Don't you see the case with the subluxation? First, do a refraction. If they're improving with the glasses and their vision is of a comfortable level, do not touch them in such cases. Yeah. Because yeah. at the time of surgery, it looks good. Later on, you end up with the different kind of problems, and the risk of detachment is very, yes. very high in such cases. Yes, yes. Can, very can, valid. Can problem. I add something? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. yes, 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 Doctor. Can I add something? Yes, so, Doctor uh, Arthi, what would be your preferred technique of lensectomy? Because in all these cases, what we do is we do intralenticular lens aspiration. Yeah. In fact, the result we have published in the journal I. But which is a completely intralenticular pressure and there is no risk of vitreous hydration. So would yeah. you go for that or you will prefer this doing a rexis and then doing this aspiration? See, depending on the subluxation of the lens, if it is possible to do interlenticular lens aspiration with the cutter, that would be much preferred because in that case, there is a risk of uh, dislocating uh, any fragments, lens fragments into the vitreous will be much, much less. And generally, lens, if you're taking the early age, there's hardly any nucleus. So even if you have dropped certain piece of the cortex, you can leave it because it gets dissolved. You don't need to go into the vitreous and, you know, do the complete vitreous in such cases. So yes, you're right. Uh, it is preferable to do the interlenticular aspiration either through the cutter or you can use a just 25 gauge cutter and with the high vacuum and little uh, cutting, you can just aspirate this lens very quickly. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much. We shall now go on to our next speaker, Dr. Arti Singh himself, who is again a very uh, proficient uh, cataract refractive. You are also a vitreous retinal surgeon? I am a vitreous retinal surgeon first. Okay, okay. vitreous retinal surgeon. <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, I do the cataract as well and I do the refractive surgery. Yeah. With and uh, who heads the Visitech Eye Center at New Delhi, and we are truly lucky to have him in our ARC webinar. And he is going to show us a very challenging case. And I hope we uh, discuss it threadbare. On to you. Yeah, thank you, Sita ma'am. And thank you, Yasi, for giving this opportunity. Uh, this case we're presenting is a very interesting case you presented to me. Uh, it was referred for me for the uh, management of steer dislocated dial. When we examined this patient, I found the entire capsule and beautiful rectus and with the complete intact bag. So it took me a while to understand why lens has dislocated posteriorly. On the extreme moment of the eye, I found there's a uh, 90 degree zonal dialysis in the inferior nasal quadrant. So that the lens has dislocated posteriorly. So anyway, we took up this case, but the challenge was how to retrieve this lens to the intact, this complete capsule and to preserve that. So we did the 25 gauge vitrectomy in this case. The point to remember here, there's nothing to partial vitrectomy or the core vitrectomy. When doing a vitrectomy, they do a complete job. Once it is done with the end gripping faucet, we pick up the 
IOL through the haptic. Now, here at this moment, I had a challenge to bring it out. So the way we could do it to eat up the entire capsule and prepare for the SFIL, that is what I we planned initially. But at the table, then I thought, why not to bring it to the dialysis? It was a hydrophilic lens, highly malleable. So I used the handshake technique, which normally we use for the fawn body removal. So that came into play, that experience. So with the handshake technique, we oriented the lens and hold it the lens haptic with the tip from the corner. You can see from here. Please do not blink now, otherwise you'll miss it. So you hold it. Then you take out your right hand out. You place the vertically the lens to the journaler, take a Mac person, and then gently squeeze it out to the journaler space, the journal dialysis space. You can see it has taken on that. You can see that dialysis out there. Once it is out, we place it. Then I made a side port. You just leave it here. Just made a side port because the leading haptic is still into the vitreous cavity, into the cavity. So now you made a side port with the left hand. I am actually ambidextrous by uh, surgeon. So I use both my hands, right and left, equally good. So with the left hand, you made a side port. And now with the uh, side port, gently you take out the lens to the dilated part, the leading haptic as well. So now you can see the entire lens is placed into the anterior chamber. Now at this point, the challenge was now again to put it, I decided to put it back into the bag as the bag was completely intact. So we used a CTR ring here, this point. The OVDs were placed constantly so that have no damage to the endothelial hernia. So a 12.5 millimeter CTR ring was used, adult size, and it was placed into the bag so that to stabilize the John Lowe dialysis part, this uh, this placed and now the bag is completely stable now i realize the bag lens which i have retrieved is upside down it is in the opposite direction so with the help of the two senses i flipped the lens again to orient it nicely it was now back the lens is flipped now it is in the um, right direction to place it and then the lens was pushed and placed into the bag. Now, this is the final position where the lens is nicely placed. And, the, and it was a complete suture-less surgery. So the next day patient was very comfortable with the 6-9 vision to this. Uh, the thanks, Dr. R.P. Singh. That was uh, immense acrobatics which you did. And I think it's <laughs> your ambidextrity or is it your being a vitreo retina surgeon? You could get away with it. But uh, yes, I have some questions now. Did the was the primary surgery done by you, or the patient came with that? It, it is referred, referred for the management. case. Uh, do you think that being a vitreous retina surgeon again? Do you think in post vitreoctomized eyes, these uh, small areas of uh, zonular weakness is missed out? Chances of IOL dislocation is more in these eyes. No, no. If you have not extended the journal dialysis further, yeah. then this remains as like a normal eye. Yeah, that should not be an issue. So at the time of surgery, you should be careful that, uh, yes, there are the chances of that. You may end up uh, creating the more general dialysis. But yeah. that time, you have to be very careful. The only thing is, you brought it through the area of zonular weakness. But when you try to rotate the IOL upside down, you could have had a PCR at that point of time. And maybe because it was hydrophilic lens and was very malleable, you could... Uh, See, once it is retreated into the anterior chamber, and uh, or the CPR is placed. So it is like many, any general dialysis case. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, but I think uh, on hindsight, with that much area of dialysis, already dialysis has had, you think that CTR support was enough? Couldn't you have uh, supported it, uh, done an SFIOL for that case? You know, your headache would be... That, that is what we initially planned. That is what we initially planned. But then uh, uh, we found this general dialysis is as we routinely managed in the normal cases and the lens bag was pretty stable. Yeah. And the taking it out, completely uh, cutting the capsule, then taking yes. it out and putting this, it was more traumatic. Yes. In this case, we have seen that this, it was the least traumatic to the eye. Yeah. We didn't take yeah. out, we didn't open the anterior chamber, cornea, no sutures. 
I would want one point from the expert panel, but just don't repeat yourselves. Just anything you differ from what you he's done and what are your contradictory thoughts to it. Dr. Sandeep? Dr. Purendra Basin? I think we are completely mesmerized by this case. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, won't, I won't have the heart to do this case. Maybe just stand next to the <laughs> surgeon, let him do what he wants. <laughs> yeah. Yes, true, very true. Even I thought that. And uh, Dr. Purendra Basin? Uh, beautifully managed, but I would prefer uh, because uh, doing a SF IUL by Yamane's technique and retrieval of the IUL, but definitely uh, he has managed it. He could do it because of his expertise. And uh, I think it is not possible in everybody's hand. And anterior yeah. segment. Yes, anterior segment surgeon. Yes. Yes, Dr. Rustagi. Yeah, anterior, anterior segment surgeon has no hole in this kind of surgery. surgery so, yes. Yes, I agree totally. So agree. He, he he basically utilized the same IUL, same sitting, and you know, yeah. uh, uh, Dr. Singh, there was no yeah. CTR. Uh, uh, the the previous surgeon must have you know obviously has put this lens in the circus. That is why it is dislocated. That is yeah, yeah. yeah. Previously no CTR has been put, so the yeah. previous there was no CTR into the circus. No, no. Yeah. In the circus, yes. Yeah, had he used the seat, uh, had he placed the lens in the bag, I think he would. This would yeah. have not have happened. Yeah, or three, yeah, or three, or three, three, He must have used three piece IUL in the bag. I think yeah. things scenario would have changed. Yeah, would not have happened. Very yeah. true. Very yeah. good point brought out. Actually, here. on the table, it was looking almost like a complete intact uh, posterior capsule. Yeah. If you notice, that it was just a thirty degree between four to five o'clock was the general dialysis. Yeah. And because it was a hydrophobic uh, single piece, it went through. It had been a three piece lens, it wouldn't have it's gone. Hydrophilic, no? Hydrophilic. It was hydrophilic, yeah. Hydrophilic, had no. been it be a single piece hydrophobic, maybe probably it would have gone. Yeah. Excellent, sir. Excellent surgery. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, shall we? Is Dr. Dilip joined us, uh, Anaga? Uh, my name is Dr. Nichlani, sir, uh, is yet to present. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, I, do, I was wondering why uh, we are going <laughs> God, you told me. About Madam, to last Madam, time. Madam wanted Dr. Nichilani to stay over here yes. for a longer period. That is why uh, he is kept I in the I thought the whole sequence has stayed. No? Oh, oh, actually, no, I was no, also no, wondering why. No, no. Why no, no. Why no, no. Why no. All Dr. Nichilani are there from the beginning. I'm so yes, sorry. sorry, sir. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's why I need Anagar to keep me alert. Uh, we go on to our next speaker, Dr. Nichlani, who is a phaco refractive surgeon from SV Eye Care Center, Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh, a very well-known figure of, uh, in ophthalmology in our country. And he is going to show us a challenging case. On to you, doctor. Thank you, madam. Thank you for giving me a chance to share my thoughts. I'm going to share my screen and uh, let us see if it has come. Let us make it full screen. Uh, so here is a case of uh, uveitic, uh, post uveitic cataract. Uh, so uh, you can see the posterior side key all around uh, the main. I see it in Can you mute yourself, please? Uh, I'm just going to remove the cyclitic membrane and many more times you get a little bit of uh, uh, hyphema or a little bit of bleeding itself. But taking out a cyclitic membrane is the mainstay so that the pupillary margin remains free and you can have a better dilatation. Once that part is done, it is always mandatory to... Um, to stain the anterior nucleus whatever uh, anti capsule is uh, there is available you can stain it but many more times you may not get uh, enough uh, dilatation then you can definitely you can stretch the pupil to a limit from where you can uh, do the phaco itself uh, these cases, many more times you get a fibrotic capsule, so you initially find a little difficulty in puncturing the anterior capsule, but with the help of two instruments, 
two sharp instruments, you can definitely puncture the anterior capsule. And to cut the fibrotic anterior capsule, you can uh, use um, uh, vitreous scissors that will definitely give you a, um, a circular capsular axis. While doing uh, hydro dissection, I, 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 I got uh, a kind of uh, sense that probably the posterior capsule is not intact. So I start delivering the nucleus, which is semi-calcified kind of thing, pushing up a viscoelastic agent into the bag and then trying to deliver the, <coughs> the semi-calcified nucleus or the cortical material into the anterior chamber, but it, it was coming in a piecemeal. So I thought, let us take a help of two instruments together that will definitely help to take out the cortical material, the calcified cortical material or the nucleus itself. And this is how it was brought into the anterior chamber. The practically whole of the calcified material UVIT cartridge, they do have this kind of uh, calcified cortical material with the nucleus itself. I could not find out a good red reflex, so I thought I would say rather going into the simple irrigation aspiration of echoing the cortical material, I will scaffold would be a better chance to uh, um, keep the vitreous away from uh, coming into the anterior chamber and uh, this soft cortical material was taken out with the irrigation itself, irrigation aspiration, but it can be taken out with the uh, FACO itself. Once that irrigation aspiration is uh, inside, you always stamp to practically take it out with the piecemeal or uh, a kind of high aspiration. So once it is taken out, I try to see if if any of the cortical material left in the bag. But since there was uh, not much of the red glow from periphery, uh, red glow was seen and I was again skeptical that there could be a chance of posterior capsular rent in the periphery. So I decided to implant IOL in the sulcus itself. You can see the thick capsular axis or the capsular margin of the anterior capsule that is giving a good support to uh, three-piece IOL, and this is how I put the IOL in the uh, sulcus. Later on, stand with the orocot and try to see if any strand of the vitreous. But fortunately, there was no uh, vitreous itself, and this is how it was all completed. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nichani. That was a challenging case which you showed. Of course, I would have preferred to have removed it with Thaco. If I have anyway put a uh, I will scaffold. Uh, Shreesh, I'm going to ask you one question. Uh, what would be the inflammatory uh, control which you would work out for these patients in the pre-operative before we bring them up for surgery? And uh, it has to be uh, quiet uh, for some time, at least for uh, uh, one month, they say, uh, we are uh, consultants. So it has to be uh, uh, quiet. And uh, uh, using uh, uh, iris uh, stretching instruments is actually only, it is indicated in these kind of cases. It's complicated cataracts. As such, there is no role for uh, uh, stretching uh, nowadays in other cases. It is the only indication for uh, iris stretching. So uh, control the inflammation uh, preoperatively uh, and uh, postoperatively, I put them on uh, uh, prednisolone estate instead of low to and. Uh, uh, slowly taper them and they, till the eye is uh, quiet, I continue steroids. At least for three months, it can go on. And uh, the chances of, again, the formation of uh, Sinecke is there. Uh, if the IOL is in the bag, you can uh, put them on uh, uh, cycloplegics. If it is not in the bag, there is every chance of uh, uh, posterior Sinecke formation and uh, it can even lead to uh, in secondary angle closure of coma at a later date. In such cases, uh, you can, it is a good idea to do a PI in these cases. I think I would have a retina surgeon and a couple of weeks. We get, uh, uh, yes. Yeah, no, I would have put them on uh, steroid drops pre operatively for a couple of weeks. 
but and I also believe that I would try would have tried to place the IOL in the bag. Did you have a PCR? Why you didn't place it in the bag? Um, Madam, because you felt not, the visibility yes, was less. Yes, I, yeah. It was so, not visible and probably. Do you think then uh, I want the experts to advise? Won't you think that so much of uh, uh, anterior uh, lens cap uh, plaque which was left behind that itself could have become a, a indolent uh, inflammation over the period of time. It Don't was not a, it? it was not a plaque, madam. It was basically a fibrous anterior capsule. Hmm. All cortical material which was fibrous or which was calcified was taken out. Hmm. I could see, I mean, say whatever the, the window available from the anterior capsule, there was no cortical material, but uh, Initially, it gave me a kind of sense that there could be a PC rent. So I uh, thought not to put IOL in the bag and uh, not to try it. So that was the only reason. I don't know. Uh, it felt as if that the capsule, it was not just a capsule which was opaque. I did feel that it was a, a plaque, or at least not, uh, plaque all around. Mm -hmm. Then you need to address that. There are... Uh, different ways you do it. If it's a fibrous plaque, you have to actually cut the excess and get a, uh, make it a larger excess so that you remove the plaque along with it. And if it is a subcapsular plaque, you need to go under plane and inject uh, hydro so that you loosen up it from the capsule and then remove it. I don't know. This is how uh, I thought. The use of uh, iris hooks in these cases, uh, I think would have increased the visibility and probably that's the first step so that all the other steps would have become much more um, easier yeah. and I think clarity of uh, decision making would have been much better probably. Excellent surgery, sir. Excellent surgery, uh, but yeah. See, in, such cases, uh, yeah in such cases, uh, I'll tell you the first thing you asked about the pre-operative thing. So depending on the cause, most of the time we are dealing with the partial entities with the complicated cartridge like this kind of cases. So it is preferable to do such cases all under the steroid cover, oral cover of the steroid. Yes. So in we start at least four days prior to the surgery, oral steroid, yes. and anti-inflammatory at least a month before. Yes. And the UVI, so the any activity should be not there, documented at least six months before the surgery. Yes. So that is the ideal scenario. And as I said, the documented six months, that means there should not be any history of pain, redness, any cells or active flare into the eye. And it has always has to be done under the steroid cover. You can give a short uh, cover of the steroids for one week after surgery. Second, at the time of surgery, generally these cartridges are the soft cartridges. They are not the hard cartridges. It's just any K which are there. So when you start the surgery, as Dr. Uh, the Harul was asking, the iris hopes, Try to avoid because this is just the least manipulation or touching of the iris. Mm. So as I said, the cataract is generally very soft. So once you enter with the viscoelastic, it dilates a little bit, then release NAK with your uh, cannula gently. And most of the time, find a slight membrane under the pupil. Yeah. So if you give a small pupil uh, plastic, you just uh, cut the pupil margin, it dilates enough for the surgery. So you don't need to, uh, you know, dilate to dilate to anything. Yeah. The main thing is that during the surgery, do not touch the iris at all, stay into the center and with the appetite to feed the, this lens metal softly into the your hands. And just with the vacuum, not using much of the fake cover, you can just complete the surgery. So the most important part into this is also to achieve good reaction. So when you're doing the reaction, stay in, always stay in your capsule, and try to achieve your axis slightly larger than what your pupil size is. So if you rotate your axis, if the macula, uh, you can use a micro forceps also, and just an iris beyond the visibility of your pupil eyes, you can have a good axis. So once it is done, the rest of the surgery is very easy. And yeah. most of the cases, at the end of surgery, we are giving PST. Yeah. Yes. And I agree with all the points, but I still feel that plaque or whatever was there has in to this be. particular case uh, okay. let me I say, say it's a little off. hurried yeah. so um, see putting lens blindly in such cases is also a little difficult because once you put lens you may have a lot of lens meter uh, behind the lens also yes. yeah. so uh, try to address all the lens meter as possible to have the least post operative inflammation 
Yes. You can have the intense post-operative in, in such cases. Yes. Yes. Even you can take a help of immunologists, particularly in these yes. cases. Yeah. Apart from yeah. uh, the routine investigations that you do at your end, you yeah. take the help of immunologists because many more times you find that uh, whatever is being, I mean, say, escaped from your end, the immunologist can find it out yeah. as a systemic disorder in a person, and that yeah. will be a nice yeah. thing to take care of the post-operative inflammation or even the pre-operative yeah. area True. where you can... Yeah. You might need immunosuppression also yeah. for these patients for a longer time. All the points yeah. very well brought out, Dr. R.P. Singh. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we'll go on to our next speaker. And uh, um, I would invite Dr. O.P. Agarwal, who's a cataract, glaucoma, and a refractive surgeon and the medical director of Rohit Eye Hospital uh, and Child Care Center Indoor. Dr. Uh, one, Agarwal, que one question, please. One question. Yes, yes, yes. If we would have put the lens in the bag, yes. uh, what are the chances of the phimosis, capsular uh, the Bike fibrosis later on. So you could aim for a larger excess, as Dr. R.P. Singh was saying. Go behind the iris and do it. And uh, make it uh, significantly large, not too large, but let it not be too small because phimosis is a challenge in this. Yes. Very valid point. Thank you, Dr. Rustagi. Uh, Dr. O.P. Agarwal, you are connected? Yeah. Yes. We'll look forward to hearing yours. Thank you. Good morning. Yes. And thanks, madam, for giving me this opportunity. Yes. Uh, today, I am going to share sequence of troubles in one of my cataract surgery. That's why I given the name Triple Trouble. Yes. This was a very hard cataract. Uh, it was hard. Can we reduce the background? Uh, can you just mute your presentation, sir? Can you mute your presentation, sir? Then we'll be able to hear you nicely. Okay. The background noise. Just just mute the video. The sound. Audio. Yes. Yeah, audio. Audio. Make the volume zero. You reduce the volume of the yeah. of your laptop. Yes, yes, yes. So now you can hear me? Yes, we can yes. hear. Hello. Now you can hear me? Yes. So yes. Audible? Yeah. Yes. So this was a very hard cataract, and I found uh, uh, Dyson's and uh, this, this was the first trouble and I converted it to uh, extracapsular cataract extraction. The nucleus is removed and rest of the cortical matter is aspirated and anterior vitrectomy is done. Here I am completing the anterior vitrectomy. The sutures are applied and I decided to implant retro iris claw lens. Before implanting the lens, the posterior segment was visualized for any cortical remnants into the vitreous cavity. There was nothing in vitreous cavity. And then we plan to implant retro iris claw IOL. So the retro iris claw was held. And the first claw, I was trying to engage retro iris in the iris claw and suddenly the lens slipped from my forceps and went into the vitreous cavity. This was the second trouble. I had to manage this trouble again. The whole corneal suturing was done. The rest of the anterior capsule uh, vitrectomy is done. And then I plan to remove the, this iris claw lens from the vitreous cavity and three port vitrectomy was done. This is all done by myself. After completing the vitrectomy, you can see that this lens is all well play, uh, sitting on the retina. After completing the good vitrectomy, the lens is held with the lens holding forceps and taken out from the anterior root 
here very important to do good vitrectomy you can see that here after vitrectomy the lens is moving itself is free from uh, all the uh, vitreous strands <clears throat> And I thought that why not I'll implant the same lens. Now I'll fix it properly in the iris, behind the iris. So the lens is hold properly with the lens, iris claw lens holding forceps. And I was trying to engage the claw, but my surprise, the lens was not getting engaged in the iris. So again, I saw that this was the third trouble and I found that the claw was broken. So again, I had to explant this lens. So the <coughs> corneoscleral uh, sutures are cut and I was fortunate to have one more, the same power lens. So again, I took the iris claw lens and at this time, I was fortunate to tuck the lens behind the iris and I was able to do it successfully. So sometimes we may have multiple troubles in cataract surgeries, but if we have good <clears throat> uh, instruments, all equipments mm -hmm. set up, we can definitely manage these type of complications. Thank you. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes that was a, a wonderful video, very challenging. Uh, I just thought we will take Anaga's video also now because Anaga is also showing an iris claw. And then we would, of course, there are a lot of different yeah. things to be discussed with each of these cases. So, yes, Dr. Anaka, why don't you start your video and again, um, we would discuss the two cases together. Yes. Is my video seen, ma'am? Yeah. 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 yeah, I kept the music off. So, basically, this was a very unusual complication and this has happened to me for the first time and blink it and you miss it kind of moment. So I'll just start the video. The first part will be in a fast forward mode. So this was a routine case where you can see the pupil is well dilated, a perfect rexis. You can see uh, the posterior sub subcapsular cataract, a gentle hydro and uh, gen uh, perfect direct chop. FACO emulsification, each of the uh, nuclear fragments are being emulsified and the perfect irrigation and aspiration. You can see the nice rexis. And now we are going on to the normal mode. This was a hydrophilic, I'm just stopping it here. This was a hydrophilic uh, acrylic lens, a single piece. So I'm loading the lens onto the cartridge and the cartridge onto the injector. Now please uh, watch very carefully. I'm injecting the lens this is in a normal speed and look what happens suddenly and i'm totally aghast as to you know what went wrong so this is now replaying in slow motion you can see at this point of time suddenly the entire bag is collapsed you know even slower as i'm withdrawing the tip of the uh, injector suddenly there is a pull and for God knows what reason, this has never happened uh, earlier and suddenly I can see that the entire bag, there is a tear and there is an entire bag which is now crumpled underneath it. So obviously there is no other way, I just extend that same incision and then I can see as with the lens the entire bag only comes out. So I put in uh, pilocarpine and try to constrict the pupil and then do a vitrectomy from the side port. So this is a totally uh, very unusual and a very uh, aghasting uh, complication. And putting in tricot to see whether there is any vitreous remaining and then doing a complete uh, vitrectomy. 
so fortunately uh, the pupil is now uh, round and come down and just checking whether there are any vitreous strands in the uh, anterior chamber once that is done i'm putting in visco elastic and now we are going ahead with uh, making a side port on the side and here, here i'm checking whether the patency of the iris claw is there or not of course with the pupil because i always believe with a dilated pupil and it is bit difficult holding the lens well first the iris claw is kept in the chamber anterior chamber hold it very well and then from the side with the side port the two side ports have to be perfectly at 180 degrees so as to give a very good uh, hold and a perfect uh, enclavement doing a peripheral iridectomy and then closing the wound so once the wound is closed i again put in a little bit of uh, tricot and then double check that there are no vitreous strands remaining in the anterior chamber a little bit of the tricot has gone posteriorly but that would probably help in reducing the post op inflammation also so at the end of the surgery the lens is in place but i was totally aghast at uh, why this occurred and i must have seen this video back at least 100 times thank you naga very well managed let's take each video uh, uh, one by one there are different aspects to each of them uh, uh, dr agarwal's case uh, uh, dr shrish i would uh, want to know now he has done a temporal ecc i mean he has done a great surgery has done it well but when you know that you need to remove the uh, lens out of the bag would you either do just a temporal scleral tunnel or maybe go and sit superiorly and do an ecc is one thought is just a one thought i wanted to be discussed yeah no like uh, i would prefer a superior tunnel uh, over a temporal tunnel uh, because i got used to it if, uh, yeah. even if it is a temporal uh, clear corneal incision if you have to convert you go superiorly and uh, uh, make a clear corneal tunnel there yeah. and uh, it was very well managed complication but uh, it could have prevented uh, this complication from happening uh the iris clip lens uh, actually uh, was introduced into the anterior chamber uh, with a dilated pupil so like he could have uh, injected uh, uh, pilocarpine and uh, made the pupil little smaller and uh, placed the lens on the iris surface and uh, he would have he could have gone from the sides like as dr anaga showed it uh, uh, clearly uh, these side ports should be 180 degrees away and uh, preferably 3 o'clock and 9 uh, o'clock position if you are sitting clearly mm -hmm. and uh, uh, that would have helped uh, uh, you you can you can place it on the surface and then uh, catch hold of the uh, uh, lens okay. at the junction of optic and haptic uh, with the help of a stabilizing instrument and uh, then uh, go behind the uh, pupillary margin and enclave it so yeah. that would have prevented that complication of uh, iwl dislocation into the vitreous cavity uh dr purendra basin i just wanted to, of course it's not totally uh, exactly relevant to the case but in a case of a very brunescent cataract <clears throat> how do we avoid a possible a, you know zonular dialysis is a possibility do you uh, say it is because of the wrong manipulation the excessive manipulation which is occurring in the bag so your tips for that uh thank you and um, the case was definitely a challenging case and uh, and a um, lot of challenges have occurred and uh, ultimately i think that is the grit of uh, the surgeon with which uh, he managed everything single single handedly yes. uh, he did a vr surgery also and he has uh, demonstrated uh, the skills of uh, everything and uh, i should appreciate but uh, at the same time i would uh, like uh, to add uh, in while doing the hard cataracts and uh, we have seen a hard brown cataract in the previous uh, surgery uh, which has been shown in this uh, symposium only so all these tips uh, are there for the high hard cataracts and chances of zonal dialysis are very high so yes. our capsular axis should be large enough yes. that is very important and yes. our chamber should remain Uh, distended with a uh, viscoat and uh, high and high density viscoelastic material 
keep the people dilated keep maintain the dilated people that that is very much important if it is not if it is reducing then use the iris hooks or pupil expanders then <clears throat> high vacuum phaco as uh, dr nagarwekar has also sandeep has also highlighted and i would also i would also prefer i start with high vacuum phaco high energy make a, a small trench bury it create a ledge hold it if you are not able to hold it you are not getting a good hold increase the vacuum don't ch start chopping it if you are finding that it is uh, anaga is also highlighted if it is rotating it is the, if it is not uh, uh, being balanced at the uh, at, uh, by the vacuum hold it first and then you chop and a horizontal chop is better in such cases and uh, chop it completely till you see the red reflex and then go and uh, do the ch extend the chop 180 degree apart on the other side make two halves then you make multiple pieces i make six or uh, seven pieces or eight pieces uh, but more than five in all these hard cataracts above three uh, fake uh, i mean grade three cataracts more than five pieces i make sometimes the hemispheres which we create they are unequal one is larger so you make four pieces in that and two pieces in the remaining one so this is what and till that time you remain in the bag you you would remain in the bag and then you engulf it one by one maybe a small chunk a small quadrant you can remove first to create a space so to avoid further zor any zonal dialysis to happen during splitting of the nucleuses or making a chop and uh, then you do the phaco emulsification one by one and uh, that is what is uh, mandatory and fill the chamber with viscoelastic throughout the procedure and this will avoid any stress on the zonules and uh, development of zonal dialysis because and uh, you have to see that uh, there is a very little uh, epinucleus in all these cases so yeah. you should uh, keep it uh, uh, when you are removing the last chunk you should uh, have you should uh, decrease the vacuum and uh, then you uh, remove the last chunk at the epinucleus mode yes yes very well valid points discussed actually dr op agarwal i was truly impressed to see your video today that you can manage the anterior segment and posterior segment with such a complete versatility uh, as far as anaga's case it's so obvious that it was a, a faulty cartridge and uh, which did the whole thing because even the injection of the iol was not uh, very forceful or you know how it happened so but again in her case i was thinking with her kind of skill sets the beautiful chops which she did she could have cut the iol uh, into two halves instead of enlarging the incision and taking out the iol but she, what point she can tell me is anyway the plan of action was to place an iris clip lens wherein you are going to increase the incision so why did she meddle around by cutting the iol there in the no point only because uh, there was no point in uh, saving the bag the bag totally yeah. was yes but yes. i am still uh, you know feeling so bad about why and how this so has happened a, a fault can you anybody uh, you know any of the expert panelists no the ac might have has it happened to anybody because this has never happened to me in the past and i was feeling no. so bad after such a good surgery to have such a complication you could have yeah. i've had one case of a small zonal dialysis which was handled by just placing a, a ctr i feel no, why this has happened in the first place like this you know, is a faulty card <laughs> faulty injector which has uh, which has released in a wrong manner there might have been some anterior chamber shallowing also at that time but it didn't look so on the video no 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 madam i think the, uh, to to be added i think the zonules must be weak was this case of pseudo exfoliation or something i think it was a normal case i had done the other I... around a week ago yes, uh, this ago yeah can i word one thing to this yes. i'm, I'm... still so junior but i had some similar complication with me also yeah. this kind kind of uh, lenses we are just putting in the lens we are injecting what i saw at the end of the insertion at the end of the like while, while we are injecting the lens at the end of the like, while haptic is going inside at that time there is a sudden uh, push inside this lens and that is the reason for this uh, sudden uh, rupture of the bag so yeah. after that what i started doing is that while put pushing the lens i just i push intermittently like uh, uh, just a give not a continuous push 
but it just pulls and then stop then push then and stop doing this for the last two two years i am putting this kind of lens and i am not not have any complication i felt was maybe yeah. when i was uh, injecting the lens maybe i withdrew it before the entire haptic had re been released that is the only thing but i have seen it so many times every time i can see that the haptic has been released and then i am re uh, removing the tip from the anterior chamber but i can't imagine it can be so bad that it could have you know actually ruptured That's the right. entire bag Anaga. yes can yes. i can i make a point yes yeah. uh, anaga actually these are common in c loop uh, hydrophilic uh, lenses where the when the posterior haptic is being released there is a rotation of the lens okay so the rotation is jerky i have had some cases with uh, bosch and lamb uh, lenses if you have a double loop thing then it is safer but a single loop c loop type when the uh, haptic is the trailing haptic is being released from the tip it suddenly jerkily rotates the lens rotates and in the same time you are removing your uh, uh, cartridge so the sample was shallowing the lens rotated and probably the lens are slightly weak you never knew that so yeah. that uh, sudden uh, or yes. where the lens rotated samber shallowed and the lens are weak led to a, a complete gender i mean semi complete yeah. you can say gender uh, uh, dialysis no no uh, that's a very good explanation thank you dr ashok yeah good day uh, madam i think the uh, only thing i can say is this yes who is speaking sorry i didn't are missing the only thing Arbe i can say i was watching it very carefully uh you didn't go wrong anywhere yeah so who is it was just a spurt of the thing it happened probably the god was wanted to tell you to remain grounded you are a very good surgeon so it is just a you know a warning from the god that he is always there yeah so once we start doing too many excellent surgeries yeah. we forget that the complication do happen so probably this is one of that act where you went nowhere wrong yeah and are you doing that surgery in the topical yes yes sir because the patient was you see it very carefully yes. just before you put the lens if you go back to that video again even before you have injected there was a slight dolisis was happening no no sir so actually just that, before that no no actually this was an edited video for in 4 minutes no sir okay. that is why okay. but there was absolutely the patient is then then told is a god sake I was like so guilty. I could not sleep for. Yeah, so it is just that we always we are the humans, we are the surgeons, and the complications can happen to anyone. So once you start doing hundred percent okay surgeries, the God comes in and tells you that. I'm no, still there. I'm the, go, I'm there. go back and learn. Go back and learn. Yeah. I must have seen this video at least hundred times. <laughs> Otherwise, it was an absolutely well performed surgery. It was perfect access, perfect uh, chop, and everything. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 Thank it, you very it, much. It, we shall now go up to our. Nothing. It could be a. It could be a negative pressure inside the anterior chamber while I mean, say, taking out the plunger out. The vacuum which has been created into the anterior chamber zonules might be a little bit loose in the periphery, and this is how the bag was taken. I mean, say, coming yes. with the uh, plunger itself. So we shall uh, now go on to Dr. Prafull Kumar, who's the is uh, um, is uh, the professor from the Department of Cornea and Refractive Surgery, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, and uh, he is going to be showing us a, a different, taking us a little out of the routine and showing us a different kind of presentation. On to you, Dr. Prafull. Thank you, ma'am, for this opportunity. So I'll case. If my video is visible, ma'am. No. Yes. Yes. So okay, this was the case uh, of both eye operated IPCL followed by right eye task with. Uh, corneal decompression and left eye intumescent cataract. As you can see in the picture, the IPCL was there. It was an intumescent cataract. And in fact, uh, IOCT also, I could see that there were fluid clefts and the vault was not that bad. But still, it was an intumescent cataract. Could have been due to surgical trauma. So I started with the case with one 2.2 incision, two side point incision, then injected some viscodispersive elastic into the entire chamber. And then I pushed the IPCL a little bit uh, backwards so that I can uh, 
pull at least one half tick out of the sulcus and then can I can pull it out. But it was not as usual. Normally, I shall it comes out quite easily. But as you could see, there were the iris pigments here. So there was dense adhesion between the IPCL and the iris. Uh, but somehow after a little bit of manipulation, I could prolapse one of the half tick out. And then I removed the lens and it came out easily. Normally, most of the IHL, they came out easily. So with little bit assisted with my limbs for self and McPherson, I could pull it out. So the next talk, uh, next task was to take care of that intermission cataract. So this is how the lens was pulled out. It came out nicely, but yes, visco dispersive viscoelastic was there to protect the endothelium. Now the capsule was stained, and I prefer this small needle technique to decrease the interlenticular pressure. As you can see, the moment I went in, some fluid came out, and also I could aspirate a little bit of that. So that gave me a little bit confidence that okay, then I can proceed with the surgery, uh, especially capsular excess. So I uh, went in with the capsular excess for self. The moment I started to uh, lift the flap, you can see I got a classic uh, Argentinian flag sign. So the rex is extended on either side. But the good part was if you focus the rex margin, it was everted. So that gave me a confidence that my rex extension is, has not gone beyond equator. So I enlarged the rex capsulotomy size a little bit using intravital scissors and forceps because the lens was soft and it was just an 18 year old boy. So I was confident the lens could be removed easily. So using irrigation aspiration system, the lens metal was removed with a bit precautions that the area where the rex is extended, I attempted to remove the cortex from that area in the at the end of the procedure. And throughout the procedure, I was keeping eye on this flap. That flap was everted, so that gave me confidence that my rex hasn't extended way on. And in between, whenever I was coming out, I used to fill uh, sodium hyaluronate at one percent, so the chamber never collapses. Then, once the lens metal was removed, I uh, made an opening of five to five point five mm to give some good visual access to the patient. And as the other eye, other eye, the patient had tasks, and uh, the there was adhesion between the lens and the iris. Uh, so I thought the UV tract may be not that friendly. To the eye also instead of uh, planning a sulcus implantation i put on single per, single piece hydrophobic uh, iq lens in the in the bag and uh, the one trick is i avoided rotating dialing the new that dialing the aisle i just stuck in uh, below that capsular rim instead of dialing the lens and then uh, the viscoelastics were removed and the wood was hydrated and the surgery was closed so there was no vitreous and the excess remained stable um, without extensing posteriorly throughout the procedure. And at one year, uh, the right eye was, corneal decompensation was there. So I did a PKP with uh, SFIL and that was doing fine. And uh, this was the picture of the right eye with a PKP with SFIL was done in this eye. And this was the left eye at one year fall of the PC was clear and the eye was when centered, the patient was reading 6-6. So this is it. Uh, thank thank you, you very much, uh, Dr. Praful. Uh, very nice uh, videos. Uh, was this the primarily your case? Um, no, it was a case referred by my fellow. Actually, mm -hmm. the story was like uh, the patient developed cataract in both eyes. So the That's primary awesome. surgeon, they did cataract in the right eye, followed uh, where they couldn't put an eye oil. The patient was left EFK okay. and the cornea got decompensated. So the patient was referred to me for cornea. But uh, by that time, the patient came to me. The other eye also had intermission cataract. So I had to operate both the patients. Yeah. I think uh, post-ICL cataracts are not a very common issue now with the holes and uh, uh, our awareness that it should not be a low vault. Might have been a case of a lens touch which could have happened. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's quite apparent. The, the screen is... I'd like to can you stop sharing your screen? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I would like to highlight one point. Uh, as I highlighted during the video, the vault was not that bad. It was not touching the lens. So most yeah. mostly the cause was instrument touch to the lens so that how done. long after the uh, primary what was the duration what was the time interval the patient came to me after three months because they had already planned uh, they did intervention in the right eye but that went wrong so then they referred to our patient that must have been when, a <coughs> when was this uh, icl surgery ipcl surgery done and when did the patient develop cataract after that surgery I, I was months. done. The patient developed cataract in both eye, but left eye it was not that uh, total. It was not a total cataract. How long was? 
uh, three months back. As, as I could see, uh, the, so, uh, most likely it is the lens touch only then. Lens touch. Well, three months uh, is very early. I am because the development of cataract usually it is subcapsular or anterior ca capsular cataract, and it usually doesn't progress whenever it is. It is touch in the mid periphery or kind of a thing. And, I know, uh, right, uh, Doctor Basin. Uh, you know, when he got his instrument out to go back to do the rexes, that when AC shallowing occurred and Argentinian flag sign. So I feel that some of these uh, intermittent cataracts where the fluid uh, clefts are less, you should actually, instead of puncturing, you're not going to get much fluid. You should actually make a small rexes right away when you go in. And then probably he could have avoided that... Uh, uh, I think um, uh, you have raised a very uh, pertinent uh, issue that how to avoid Argentinian flag sign in an intumescent cataract. I think there are various methods and one is that uh, I, what I do is uh, I usually aspirate the cortex, uh, a fluid cortex and uh, from the lens and uh, by making a small uh, neck uh, or opening with the needle itself. I go with the straight needle and aspirate the fluid, and but uh, our chamber should also remain uh, um, formed throughout, and uh, that is what I do. And then enlarge that rexis and small rexis, then enlarge it further when you have removed the loose cortex, and that can prevent and two-step surgery, as you have said. I think two-step capsular rexis that will uh, help us, or spiraling of the capsular rexis. Yeah. No, I actually, I heard a very wonderful uh, thing here in uh, Narayan Italy yesterday about making a cruciate incision. Uh, you know, when we did can opener those days, we were not getting these Argentinian flag sign kind of challenges. So instead of making just one nick and aspirating or decompressing or keeping viscoelastic, maybe there is some, we should all go back and think there's some logic in making a cruciate incision yes. and completing it, the excess in the same go then maybe the stress forces are acting in different direction. So the Argentinian flag tend to get triggered off may not happen. Yes. I think uh, I did two points are there. One is uh, Dr. Rajendra Prasad has come out with the, uh, this thing that uh, he makes a circular entry in the anterior chamber and a sewing needle kind of a thing. So instead of making a linear uh, opening, he yeah, makes a yeah. circular opening. Yeah, and then, uh, yeah. he, he, they, you can, uh, the, through that, the fluid escapes yeah, out. Yeah. Making a, a, a C and, curve also makes sense. I agree. And uh, then other thing was uh, highlighted by Dr. Kamal Kapoor in the same session only. And then he said that he, to make a T-shaped uh, opening in the anterior capsule. Yeah. So that, uh, you make an initial opening and then you cut it yes. and make it T-shaped. So that will also, like you have said that making a cruciate, so that will disperse the uh, extension forces and uh, yeah. that will not... Pre uh, yes, ma'am. Actually, the basic principle here is the intralenticular pressure is greater. Yeah. So we need to decompress the capsular bag. So yeah. whatever kind of nick is made, it is important to decompress the bag so that the anterior capsule is flat. Okay, yeah. The moment the anti so the pressure in the anterior chamber has to be greater than the intralenticular pressure. That is the principle. Yeah. Only then it will not extend. Yeah. Actually, in these cases, flax also will work well. I agree. And even with the IPCL, I've done a case where there was an IPCL and we have done flax on it. So that yeah. will give you a perfect rexis because here rexis is the most important critical point here. Yeah. So, no, internal lenticular pressure is the crux. I, I think that is the most important thing. But how to avoid extension of the rexes and, and, and developing an Argentinian flag side? Avoiding so decompression and aspiration of the liquid cortex. That, that he was also doing. He still had it. So that is why we wondered whether it should be a cruciate or an inverted C or a T-shape so that... Or, you know, or a small riches in the first instant itself. Like like, uh, can, I add one thing here. can I add one point? Yes. Uh, yes. These intermittent cataracts, of course, uh, the uh, intravitreal pressure and uh, intralenticular pressure has to be controlled. And the uh, anterior uh, pressure, like anterior chamber pressure, has to be increased. That is by uh, injecting a high molecular weight uh, with elastic substance. So, uh, like, uh, we have to make multiple uh, cuts in the center, cruciate as sort of. Uh, 
uh, Chitra mentioned it, uh, that actually distributes the tension on these uh, tears. Yeah. If it is a uni uh, single tear, uh, the chances of uh, exchange to the periphery is high. If you are making multiple uh, tears in the shape of a star-shaped uh, yeah. tears, the centripetal uh, in, in the centripetal direction, so that reduces the tension on these uh, capsular tears. And then you go ahead and aspirate the central uh, 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 viscous uh, uh, cortex or uh, liquid cortex. Viscous cortex is the problem. The liquid cortex usually won't give trouble. So it's the viscous cortex that has to be aspirated. And in this particular case, uh, uh, it, it is it's most probably it is a traumatic intumescent cataract because uh, if it is because of the lens, uh, uh, phakic lens, it will be an anterior subcapsular or it can be a high myopic patient, it's a nucleosclerosis, but here it is a intumescent cataract. Uh, and uh, uh, the nicely done surgery and finally the patient uh, did very well. Uh, yeah. But like uh, uh, enlarging the rexis like uh, without aspirating the fluid uh, should not have been uh, done. So you, you can enlarge the rexis, but uh, like uh, aspirate uh, as much of uh, this thing, uh, viscous uh, cortex as possible. Doctor uh, uh, Sandeep, are you there? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, Dr. Sandeep, no. do you think in an Argentinian flag time, a single uh, directional tear will have less chance of a wraparound tear or a bi-directional? I mean, it is just offhand, I'm just wondering. Yeah, but you know, it's very difficult to execute it. See, what happens is the moment, if you make a careless tear in the anterior yeah. capsule, yeah. that itself can spread to the periphery. Yeah. You, you have to be very careful. You have to make sure as yeah. uh, he was saying, you know, make sure that your anterior chamber pressure is high and yeah. you have to make a very careful tear. Like yeah. Purendra said, you need to go in and aspirate a little fluid cortex. So there are so many things in this and each has to be on a case basis. Yes. The main yes. thing is the surgeon has to decide after making the first puncture and he must be ready with the second step immediately. Immediately. Yes. So if, if your bi-directional tear, as you said, yes, it will distribute the forces, but yeah. you have to make sure that you execute it immediately. What yeah. happens after the first nick is the most important. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Can, can I add one thing, ma'am? No, tomorrow, na. Yes, sir. So, yes. you, so uh, as, yes, I, as, as, as you keep, uh, so there have been a lot of technique. Even in this, also, I followed the small incision aspiration technique. But yeah. Dr. Chitra, in the very beginning, she highlighted one point which I would like to highlight because after this case, we really went through the video again and again. So, there are two types of interlenticular raise pressure in one is there is liquefied cortex yes. that usually you can aspirate or you can make yes. cruciate incision there is another group now a lot of practice lot of surgeons they have put their videos in youtube yes. where the lens fibers are swollen so it yes. was a case where the lens fibers were swollen yes. so i doubt it would have been possible to make a cruciate incision that much time wouldn't have been allowed yeah. and in uh in when the lens fibers are swollen even if you apply viscoelastic because it was an edited video so i didn't show that I had to, I supplemented the enter chamber with Helon 5. So, which is 2.5% sodium hyaluronate. In spite of that, the rex is extended. Mm -hmm. So, all this technique, yes, it works, but the, when the fluid is uh, milky, yeah. when the lens fibers are swollen, it's very difficult to prevent the Argentinian flag. Yeah. Maybe the yes. CV technique may help. Yeah. Dr. Marana. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, keeping the status of the patient in mind, single eyed almost. Age, institute, why not the flex was the first, uh, first choice? Flax. See, uh, the flax at RP Center cost you around 35,000. It was a very poor patient and somehow that's why he opted for IPCL. So that was the constraint. We cannot do flax. Right. For flax, the patient had to make payment. So that was not possible. Yes. Thank or you. Or else that would have been the preferred choice. Yes. Thank you. We shall now go on to our next speaker. That was a wonderful video, Dr. Prophet. Uh, we go on to our next speaker, Dr. Subodh uh, Singh, who's a, uh, I'm surprised this time we do have a lot of uh, FACO and uh, vitreo uh, retina surgeon combinations in this session. So uh, he's an, again another uh, surgeon who's both a FACO surgeon and a vitreo retina surgeon from Orchid Medical Center Super Specialty Hospital in Ranchi. And uh, he's going to be showing us a case of Traumatic Brunus and cataract with dialysis, iododialysis, and zonular weakness. On to you, doctor. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, uh, for this kind words. And I'm first time I'm presenting this AIUS uh, ARC. So this is my case. 
this is the case of uh, post traumatic burunsen cataract with iridodialysis with general dialysis so we started this case so we made a, a side port and then air adri dye was given to this we had a plan to repair iridodialysis with cataract surgery so i make a localized peritomy to that iridodialysis area keeping in mind to repair the iridodialysis at the end of the surgery now at the then at the same time, same area i put this two iris soaps to make pupil size more bigger and then just made a main port and put a visco elastic elastic and the capsule was so thick and fibrous so i started doing with the capsulotome and somehow i was able to manage this but capsulotome was not perfect to do that so then i put uh, take this uh, uh ilm forceps followed by this iris the uh, capsule uh, capsule axis forceps so but at the end this this capsule was so fibrous so i need to use this ilm scissor to cut it down and after that i put uh, fill the anterior chamber with visco elastic with viscoats and then started doing feco so after doing this crater in the center and I started doing chalk to the and by quadratically i just was removing the cataract by doing feco so while at taking the last chip i had this pc rent at that time so i stopped doing feco at this time and i just filled the bag with the visco elastic substance and then i put the lens so that the vitreous should not come out and the chamber should be stable and posterior communication should be so it stop so i put the lens and then started doing feco to so the rem remaining cataract was removed by doing this and after that i put the air and found that some vitreous was there in the ac so i did a limited anterior vitrectomy to make anterior chamber free of vitreous and lens to be stabilized and at the end i just put the air bubble and it was the vitreous that was totally removed in that so but getting this complication i deferred the iri uh, iridolysis repair i thought i could, i will be doing the next setting so by this like this i ended my surgery Thank you, thank you, thank you, Doctor Subo. There are multiple challenges in your uh, video here. Um, as far as uh, if you can stop sharing your screen, um, uh, shall we? Yeah, uh, Doctor uh, Doctor Basin, I would ask you: in a case of a capsule fib uh, fibrosis, uh, uh, I think uh, you realize early on itself whether there is a subcapsular plaque or it is a fibrous plaque. so based on that you decide whether you need to make a cut and then maneuver rather than maneuvering it and creating a dialysis in the process um, in this particular case in specific he has had a a, a pcr there would you uh, think of putting the a single piece in the bag without doing a vitrectomy or then a tricot i mean i would have been uh, even ready that by doing a vitrectomy the size of the rexus could increase unless it's a circumscribed rexus so those probabilities are there but i would not take a chance of placing a single piece in the bag without the vitreous being managed so i want your thoughts on that uh, yeah thank you um, uh, it was a uh, doctor swood very challenging case and uh, you have um, done it uh, nicely your beginning was good you have um, very nicely um, put the iris hooks and uh, made the pupil di di um, dilated and um, visualization was there throughout so uh, that was good the thing is that when you see the fibrous capsule and if, if it is coming in between your rexis 
we when you are making a rexes i think at that particular point only you use a curved kind of a, a micro caesar and or a vana caesar and make a nick in the capsule mm-hmm. so instead of a straight caesar a curved caesar will be better that gives a better shape and extend it till you see that there is a fibrosis in the area, in that particular whole area you have to cut it because it is not going to uh, extend like that and if you are pu- going to stretch it or pull it you are definitely going to damage uh, or uh, create a zonular dialysis or extension of the capsular axis and extension to the posterior capsule so that is one thing secondly coming to the point when that uh, when we have developed a zonular uh, the posterior capsular rent and uh, you should have used uh, uh, the transnodal at that particular stage only mm-hmm. and see whether there is a vitreous and plug mm-hmm. that vitreous if it is there not in the anterior chamber it is not prolapsing plug the vitreous with the viscoat mm-hmm. and i would have used a three piece lens because your capsular uh, uh, is not uh, bag is not intact and i would have preferred to use a three piece lens in this particular case and yeah, prefer a three piece lens in the sulcus and optic capture it if my rexus is round enough because uh, putting a three piece lens without doing a pcc posterior capsular rexus injecting a pcc in that capsule itself will enlarge the rexus enlarge it yeah. so you have to um, complete that uh, ex- opening in the posterior capsule into the pcc and uh, plug the vitreous no vitreous should be anterior chamber check it twice or thrice at each step you should check whether the with the vitreous in along that there is no vitreous in the anterior chamber yes and then you manage it yeah. actually the first thing i just want to say yes. usually uh, like for me like if i do a vitectomy the hypotony there is chance of hypotony is more if you do a vitectomy and yeah. if you managing this vitreous so what i thought is just i putting the lens and remaining the vitreous is left in the anterior segment we can uh, remove it with the vitectomy after this uh, like putting the lens that was my first aim because it was a complicated surgery and i don't wanted to make it more complicated because while doing a vitreous vitectomy in the anterior chamber without any barrier so keep on the vitreous is coming and there is the hypotony and the chances of enlarging the posterior rent was a circular it was not linear so i thought i might be putting the lens because i single piece lens if the pcc is not so enlarged so they quite do no, see the- that you must have been the judge at that time we couldn't make out in this video if you feel that the vitreous phase was intact then you could have injected viscoat there and then placed the single piece lens in the bag and mm-hmm. if the if your pcr was small and then of course still then gone ahead and done a, a tricot to see whether there's any vitreous and removed right. it and that uh, visco that the lens in the bag would tamponade more vitreous from coming forward so right. that could be there but if there was some kind of a fluid vitreous in that region and uh, things were not looking good at that time you should not go and put a, a right. piece in the bag that was what we were trying to say Yeah thank you thank you i'm sure you were the best judge at that time thank you very much you. i think we should go on to our other speakers there are three four of them um, because uh, purendra basin has clearly explained everything uh, we uh, we shall now go on to dr dilip lalwani who is a cataract and a glaucoma consultant from om Net- om netra kendra and laser vision center from raipur and uh, he is going to tell us something even more interesting on to you dr dilip can you share your video thank you ma'am thank you and uh, thanks for giving this opportunity and uh, uh, as uh, rightly said in this uh, rexis is a would you switch off your video dr dilip your network is very bad good uh, emulsification Dr. Dilip, can you switch off your video so that you should not see? Ah, now could you? Uh, should I play? Yeah, you play the video. His oh, next sir, I'm playing. Yes, Dr. Dilip, could you stop mm-hmm. sharing your video? Let him play from um, uh, Mr. Sunil's end. Yeah. Hmm. I have stopped. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks all india society for giving me this opportunity and this is the continuous uh, capsular access is the most crucial step 
and but if you got landed in trouble in a very first second in this crucial step you got capsular rip or radial tear in a both the way and you don't know where to convert or continue then uh, i thought that we should take a chance and in this case uh, not a small radial extension it is a large extension so i thought that i uh, made a make a continuous uh, axis in one half first uh, to make a uh, to avoid a unnecessary stress on capsules and uh, just i take a one nip and make a this continuous uh, axis in one half and uh, similar i did in a uh, other half after making assure that uh, capsule is uh, flattering or capsule is free, not extending up to the equator i thought ki we should move on to slow feco and this uh, make continuous in a both the axis both the half now i made a cut down all parameters in a slow and uh, still flap is uh, fluttering so i thought we should continue on a slow parameter and instead of uh, direct chop or instead of uh, divide and conquer i uh, gradually debulk the nucleus debulk all the side all the side and try to pick initial one piece tiny piece so that i make a space in the bag and uh, don't put a unnecessarily stress on capsules so i was trying to pick one a small piece so that i proceed so that's why all parameters are down bottle heights are also low so gradually it was a struggle to take away first piece some cracking is there and i pick one piece and i complete uh, the feco in a slow motion and after this gradual slow feco cortical clean this way still there is a capsule is uh, fluttering and and this way i emulsify all the segments and cortical clean up has done and now what to do what to put i well so i made a choice a single piece hydrophobic over the bag not in the bag i don't know it is not up to the equator but it is very risky to put uh, i well uh, inside the bag so that time i have uh, multi piece lens i did not have available in my ot so i put hydrophobic single piece over the bag in the sulcus and this is a stable over the bag i will i put and that's what thanks thanks man oh thank you very much uh, that, that was a nicely done case and you managed it very well uh, now uh, what would be the uh, dr sandeep or dr rustagi any one of you could answer in these particular cases what should be the uh, choice of iul would you want to place a, a given a choice a three piece would be a better lens to place or a single piece or it actually doesn't matter uh, i would put a three piece as my first choice you know yeah. if i have the three piece lens i would put that yeah. now even in this particular case where he didn't have a three piece lens i don't think he should have hesitated to put a single piece lens in the bag he should he could have you know yeah so because because the uh, zonules were intact there was no vitreous prolapse yes. and you knew where the rex had attended so if you could put the lens and orient the lens at a the right angles uh, perpendicular to the uh, axis in which the lens had split i yeah. think a single piece lens could also have done uh, but he should not have put it in the sulcus my message to everybody is yes. uh, do not put a single piece lens in the sulcus because sooner rather than later it is going to give you problems Yes. of uvi it is secondary glaucoma and all these other problems yes yes 
Now, supposing this was a case of a toric IOL, hmm. uh, it is a case of a toric IOL, uh, how would you deal with it? You would place the IOL in the bag with the, you don't have that full uh, wraparound of the toric IOL. Would you still go ahead and do it? Or yes, ma'am. I, I think I would. I, uh, yeah. I, I think I would because see, in this case, I would put transonomal to make sure that there is no vitreous. Yes. And you know that except for the two points at with the axis that extended to the equator, the rest right. of the zonular apparatus is intact. Yeah. Yes. So there is no problem in putting this. Yeah. It's only if this has extended to the posterior capsule or yeah. zonular dialysis has occurred yeah. in a major way, the yeah. capsular bag is unstable, yeah. then I would uh, definitely hesitate to put a toric lens. But otherwise, I think I would uh, easily put in a single piece. Yes, yes. The trick is, I think, uh, to dial the trailing haptic. Uh, by the Sinsky oak inside the bag. In, yes. Instead of uh, dialing the lens and then uh, rotating the lens and dialing it into the bag, the trailing, the other one haptic should go, uh, the advancing haptic should go in the bag. And the trailing haptic, you have to dial it or you have to not to dial it, you have to push it by, by the Sinsky oak and uh, then into the bag. That should be the way instead of uh, rotating the lens in the bag and creating further zonal dialysis. Dr. Rukhagi, when would yes, you sir. think you would convert to SICS in these cases? When you have had this kind of a Rex's extension, when would you take that call? Any of y'all could answer. I'm, it is just a different thinking thought process I want to get initiated. Is there yeah. any moment? And you are not able to do FACO. I yes. think that is the yes. time. That is the time. You are not able to get uh, do the hold and chop. And uh, you are finding it difficult. You are finding that uh, there is a PC rent and has developed, or it is extending to the extended to the posterior capsule. I think that is the point where you have to convert. Yeah. If it's a hard cataract and there is a lot more manipulation needed, and this rexus is uh, as extended as it, maybe that's the time you would uh, you could consider converting to an SICS. Uh, Chitra, Chitra, could I make one point there? Yes, yes. Yeah, sometimes, you know, we talk of SICS, but SICS is probably sometimes more traumatic, you know, trying to manipulate a huge nucleus out. So if you are a confident FACO surgeon, yes. and if you are able to chop, yes. and chop safely, as I said, with good vacuum, yeah. hold and everything, I think you can manage, you know. Yes, you, yes. you need to be a very good SICS surgeon also. Yes, yes. So, so shall we go on to our next speaker, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ashok Nanda, are you there? Yes, yes, he's there. Please oh. unmute, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, he's a, a senior uh, cataract and refractive surgeon, founder and medical director of Curvision Eye Hospital, uh, Orissa, and uh, he would be showing his uh, excellent video. On to you, doctor. Yeah, I'd like uh, uh, Sunil to play the video because the internet is not good here also. Uh, and uh, Dr. Ashok Nanda is another very amazing surgeon, very versatile and prolific. And uh, I'm sure he's going to show us something very brilliant. I'm going to show some of the mistakes I did in a case which I shouldn't have done. Uh, it was a 90-year-old person with a grade 4 uh, brown cataract, one eyed. Yeah. So the first thing is we should not have chosen this patient to be done on a topical. Because you can land up anywhere. This patient also had some amount of lax zonule. Uh, somehow I could manage to do a rexis without too much of uh, pull on the zonules. So uh, then, second mistake I did was in a brown cataract when the zonules appeared to be loose, my hydro was not adequate. I did not try to rotate, thinking the zonules might become further loose. So I started doing FACO and you can see when I was trying to hold, the whole bag was getting pulled. So here I decided that to stabilize the bag, at the outset I would put in a CTR ring and probably uh, uh, go ahead and do the surgery. And once the CTO was in place, I was a little more confident and started doing a, a, a direct chop technique. Again, I normally would do a stop and chop in a very hard brown cataract because 
that gives me more space to manipulate and in a patient where the genules were loose doing a stop and chop would have been little better it's right of having to use little more energy so here you can see that i was struggling to separate the posterior plate because i had not had enough space and i was afraid to pull the uh, pieces uh, too much laterally to exert more tense stress on the genules so in that process i had to rotate and make sure that the plate was divided properly before taking out the first piece which i intended to i had to use two two instruments to rotate because my separation hydro separation was not adequate so once that was done then uh, i could manage to remove a piece of endonucleus which gave me space to manipulate further this was being done repeatedly you can see the uh, the size of the people is coming down somehow once the crack was complete i could then remove the second half more into the pupillary plane and continue to do the uh, peco in a more superficial plane again when the genules are loose and you have already put a ctr taking out the rex the the cortex was a talent so you must try to hold and sort of swing it laterally rather than pulling it centrally to loosen the loosen the uh, cortical fibers so instead of a uh, uh, centripetal force it should be more lateral and gradual and slow so that it is loosened and the 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 uh, genules are not further stretched and of course uh, at the end i could with luck manage to fit in a lens in the bag but the video was given to actually uh, highlight the mistakes which a person should not do never attempt a uh, the uh, a hard cataract one eyed patient yes. 90 year with a loose genules Yes. Without block, that is a mistake. Yeah, and have, do a hydro dissection properly before you, know, you actually. You could have done a, a subtinon, and you could have given a proper stop and chop, and completed the case uh, much faster and got actually, out. Actually, this patient was referred to me on the table because oh. some other doctor <laughs> who yeah. had taken it for himself did not find it. Yeah. Uh, you know, confident enough to do so on the table, I did not have yeah. any option, but decided to do it. Now this, and, I wanted to ask you directly. Uh, do you feel doing a bimanual rotation in a pace of a zonular weakness uh, is a safe step to do? I have never done it, so I was asking you. It is definitely because if you do a uh, in, uh, one instrument technique, then you are stretching the opposite zonules. Yes. So doing it under viscoelastic, and here uh, remember I told that I did not do a good hydro dissection because yes. of the fear yes. that uh, you know. i think one very important message is in a case of a zonular weakness doing a hydro uh, procedure appropriately is most important because only if the nucleus is free can the manipulations which we do further will not impact the uh, remaining yeah, zonic less effect. traumatic less traumatic yeah to be less traumatic yeah. yes anaga you ask your question yeah, another thing when the people started coming down na yeah. maybe you could have waited put in phenocaine plus Mm. or this thing and then continued because visibility is most important already yeah. there were challenges of zonular weakness and the hard brown cataract plus yeah. if the visibility comes down then there are greater chances of you touching the pupillary margin than further pupillary you know yes, uh, that is why that is why i started lifting the pieces into the pupillary plane i started doing the last in a couple of pieces the intracameral midriatics would have made it a little easier i know yes yes that's correct yes I think uh, it's a very self-explanatory video. Unless my expert panel have extra point to add, shall we go on to our next speaker? Yes, ma'am. Yes, our uh, next speaker is uh, Dr. Shreesh Kumar, who I have already introduced to you all, and he is going to also show us something very different and challenging. Takes us into a different direction of thought process. So on to you, Dr. Shreesh.
Unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chitra. So, this is, I'm going to present a challenging situation. It's not a challenging case, but it's a challenging situation, uh, which is a broken haptic in a multifocal toric eye implantation. So, this particular patient was a 71 years old female, uh, total cataract with the uh, visual acuity of counting fingers, uh, uh, hand movements. And uh, so, uh, this is the case sheet of the same patient. Uh, the B scan was normal. And uh, this is the um, biometry and uh, the patient uh, required a T4 series uh, that is uh, according to Barrett's TK toric it is uh, 10.5 diopters uh, spherical power with 2.25 uh, cylindrical power at the eye oil plane and uh, uh, so the patient uh, needed this low powered eye oil and uh, the surgery it's actually a total cataract uh, uh, with the some amount of intermittency I went ahead with the uh, moderate sized rexis in this particular case and the surgery went very well. I could uh, do a safe uh, safe emulsification here and uh, the, it's a multifocal toric uh, which uh, went through 2.8 millimeters but uh, to my surprise uh, the uh, the haptic the leading haptic was broken. At this point of time I had uh, uh, the classical teaching is to remove the eye oil and replace it with the uh, new lens, that is the toric multifocal lens, which is actually not available at that uh, low uh, power. Uh, this particular patient had our 10.5 adapters of uh, uh, spherical power and uh, uh, we immediately contacted the comp company person and uh, uh, he could tell only that uh, this particular lens will be available only after 15 days. And uh, the patient is uh, from a far off place, so I had no other choice uh, but uh, try this particular lens. Uh, so I tried uh, placing this lens itself uh, in the uh, in the capsule bag with the optic capture. Uh, so I never, I've never done this uh, before, uh, this particular case. So the two challenges here are, one is the centration of the lens, it's a multifocal lens. Second one is uh, rotation. The orientation of the lens also has to be uh, properly oriented. And uh, so there is a chance of uh, rotation because you are placing the lens with the optic capture. Uh, and uh, I didn't know how this lens behaves and I could complete the procedure on the table, it was stable. And uh, post-operatively, uh, so because I could uh, uh, manage to have a moderate sized rexis, I could place the large sized optic, that is around six millimeters uh, uh, with the optic capture. And uh, this is the first step post-operative picture. The lens was nicely placed and it was dot on 159 degrees and the visual acuity was six by six and uh, with a small uh, spherical error of uh, uh, 0.75 diopters for near. And we did a uh, UB scan uh, and uh, to check the position of the lens. The lens, that is a, uh, this is a haptic uh, which is present. There is no haptic here. There's a small uh, uh, bit of haptic is there, uh, but there is a significant gap between the iris and the lens. And uh, this is anti-segment OCT. This is a one month post-operative picture of the same patient. And I could not see the details here because the AS OCT will not give those details. And this is three months post-operative picture. Again, the patient is 66 part, uh, 66 uh, with a small correction of 0.5 adapters, it is N6. And uh, at one year, that is the patient could complete. The last month, the patient came here for a follow-up. and. Uh, uh, this is exactly the lens position is exactly at 159 degrees and uh, the patient did very well 66 six plano and 6 uh, plano this is another case uh, based on this experience i attempted uh, this particular case also this again uh, the accidental uh, uh, tear uh, broken haptic here the leading edge the same company i don't know what is the problem is the leading haptic which has broken railing haptic we can understand but the leading haptic breaking is something uh, uh, I cannot explain. And uh, I, with the experience gained from the first case, I confidently went ahead and uh, placed the lens after removing the viscoelastic substance from the antechamber and from behind the uh, lens. So I placed the lens with the optic capture uh, nicely. This is actually a 0 180 degree orientation. 
So finally, I adjusted the lens position. This is not the right way to do it, but I had no option, so I went ahead with this. So there are like uh, uh, questions, maybe like because this is a bulky haptic, it can rub against the iris and can cause UITs and all. But uh, uh, to my surprise, we had no such uh, uh, symptoms in both the cases. This is a nicely placed, and then uh, I subjected it to very on, uh, it was uh, centered very well and it was positioned very well. And this is the six months post operative picture. This particular patient uh, completed six months of the primary procedure and uh, it's exactly at uh, 0 180 degree orientation. You can see the nice uh, capsule wrapping around the uh, lens and uh, plano 66 and 6. There's no pigment dispersion, no UVAT's glaucoma, no rotation, and uh, no decentration. So the I think uh, in the indicated cases, if you have no choice, I think we can go ahead and uh, uh, place these lenses uh, with the optic capture and uh, 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 lens haptics in the sulcus. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shish, for uh, presenting something uh, different and controversial. Uh, Dr. Sandeep, uh, I, I actually want to know whether any of you could explain how a le uh, leading haptic could have got uh, fractured it was some kind of an IOL manufacture or some defect in the loading of the lens in the cartridge which uh, triggered it. And any of you could comment on that. And I, uh, I, I, I have no clue at all about yeah. what is the leading haptic. I mean, yeah. I've never seen that. Yeah. Yes. I've never seen that. Yes. Was it, was it a butterfly type of cartridge or a normal routine cartridge? It's a butterfly type and it's possible that it might have, you know, got trapped. Yeah. Yes. The butterfly, yeah. 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 loaded the lens also. Yeah. The like, other... uh, the sisters will load these lenses and uh, it's a lens. The other thing I want is what is your post-op management when you're going to leave a bulky single piece uh, haptic? Uh, what would you do anything? For it the... was not different in this particular case. I have not the done anything. Was in the bag. Yeah, the haptic the optic uh, was, was outside the bag. It is only the optic inside the bag. Yes, yes. So True. the optic capture, the proper optic capture, posterior optic capture. It is not a reverse optic capture. It is a posterior optic capture. And uh, one thing uh, what I noticed uh, from these two cases is there is not even one degree of rotation. It stayed uh, in the position where it intended to be. Sir, uh, yeah, uh, I think. Yes. Anaga, go ahead. Please go ahead. I'll talk about it. No, no, just one clarification. The uh, haptics were in the sulcus and the optic was brought out, right? Yeah. Inside, yeah. Right. No, no, so, just. Oh, it's an optic capture, you know, like uh, oh, yeah. the no, optic the was inside. Uh -huh. this, is, this is this is a reverse optic capture. Haptic, no, no. Haptic, haptic is in the sulcus. Haptic, haptic is in the bag. bag. No, 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 no. Haptic is not in the bag. Haptic is outside. Haptic is in sulcus. Opti yeah, optic. Yeah, yes. Right now, optic is haptic. captured because optic is captured and the capsular axis is of perfect size. Uh, that is and well centered. I think that is the crux, and um, I should appreciate Shirish for this uh, novel thing. And uh, you can highlight this further if it is not rotating. That is really good. No, but then if the haptic is in the sulcus, then there is likely to be irritation. Haptic in is in bag. Uh, haptic is in sulcus. Optic is in bag. Yeah. So yeah. The I, even taken a UBM picture, uh, you could see the distance. There, there is a, a significant distance between the iris and the uh, bulky this thing uh, haptic. Doctor, Doctor so the broken edge of the haptic the patient was, yes. because the patient was a myopic patient. So yeah. you had quite a significant amount of antechamber death, and that's yes. why you escaped. Yes. Uh, in most of the other cases, you might uh, 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 not be that lucky. Kind of a chronic irritation. No, the second case was a normal case, 21 diopters. Uh, since uh, I gained some experience out of the first case, so I went ahead with the, otherwise you would have replaced it with the new lens. The second case was a normal uh, patient, 21 diopters. Sir, but so the ragged... also, there was no pigment dispersion and it is the seventh month running. The patient uh, had a six month follow up and uh, it was quiet. So the ragged... Then, edge of the broken haptic would be now against the posterior surface of the iris, right? Yeah. So, which it can happen later on or with anybody. 
I thought it was the opposite that the oh. broken haptics were in the bag. So it was covered oh. by the anterior capsular rim. But even and I the thought. The optic being above the uh, capsule oh. was okay because then that would not really. Yeah. Even if you, no, no. One thing I want to clarify is uh, even if you place the optic outside that is on the surface, yeah. it can rub the pupillary margin or the posterior surface of the iris. But no. it is not. So this is one uh, small rim. No? Like, uh, it's one small rim which is rubbing. Actually, next time you want to do this, do want to do this trick? No, leave the haptic in the bag and bring the optic out if your excess is small. You can still get a centered uh, eye. No, no, that is the other way of doing it. That is a reverse optic capture. But uh, I tried this and it stayed very well and uh, it is easy to do. Reverse optic capture is little difficult to do. Okay. Yes, Doctor Sandeep, you have to tell something. Yeah, just last. yeah, just two comments. Number one, when he said that he didn't have the IOL power, yeah. I think I would have waited for the IOL to come after eight days. Why not? Yeah, and this is actually for 15 days. They, the company has told this is a low powered IOL with the toric power, multifocal. So and uh, the patient is from a different state, actually. So the patient stayed only for one day, and we, we should have called the patient, but the, it was some tricky situation and the practical issues. And uh, that was in my mind. If this was not staying, uh, I could have called the patient after 15 days and placed the lens. But all the more reason when the patient is not staying in your place and is going away and he's unsupervised, it is mm. better that, yeah. you know, yeah. it is better that you uh, uh, don't take a chance of leaving the lens, especially when you leave a single piece in the haptics. No, we have taken a chance and it has worked. <laughs> yeah, that's the innovation you can say. It's an innovative yeah, yeah. way. I think it's fine. <laughs> All innovations <laughs> happen under compulsion. Yeah. Yeah. Only, yes, I could confidently do it because of my first experience. Yeah. Just okay. one more thing, one, yes. one more small thing, especially in premium uh, multifocal torix, I would prefer to load the lens myself under the microscope. No, no, no. In no, a busy no. practice, it is, you know, <laughs> they are all extremely good sisters. Uh, they, they are better than us. Reloaded, it's better okay. Than us, actually. As far that's as a technis, it, that's a technis multifocal. It has a, it doesn't have a multi, uh, you know, catalyst, uh, which is requiring a butterfly, no? Yeah. I don't know why you used a butterfly catalyst. No, yeah. this is Icryl Toric. Oh, okay, uh -huh. okay. Toric. So we shall now go on to our last speaker, uh, Dr. Viveka Nandan, who is a young, dynamic, extremely uh, uh, capable and excellent surgeon and is a medical consultant uh, at the Arvind Eye Care Systems at Pondicherry and he's involved in the intraocular lens and cataract services. So let's uh, hear what this uh, young surgeon has to show us. On to you, Vivek. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I thank uh, Chitra Madam and ART for giving me this opportunity. So today I'll be showing my technique of uh, scleral fixation of intraocular lens. So it is a simplified version. So inspired from Yamane's technique, uh, this is our take on it. So this was a traumatic cataract. Uh, this was a camp patient who had trauma. The uh, nucleus was floating in the uh, AVF and uh, there was a little bit of posterior synecase. So we decided to remove the whole bag, whole uh, nucleus, uh, the cataract. So it was attached at uh, probably uh, uh, somewhere nasally for two clock hours. Uh, the rest, it was totally mobile. So after uh, the nucleus has been expressed out, uh, first, the sclerocarnel tunnel was made and then the nucleus uh, was expressed and anterior bimanual anterior vitrectomy was done to clear off the vitreous. So once the vitreous is cleared, I do not use viscoelastic. I form the anterior chamber tightly and using a toric marker, uh, I mark two points to indicate where I want to place the scleral fixated lens. So two millimeters away from the limbus, I create a small indentation. I catch hold of the conjunctiva, pull it towards the limbus so that at the end of surgery, the conjunctiva is over the uh, uh, sclerotomy site. On the other side, I use a 26 gauge needle and then slowly the long needle with 70 proline suture is gently railroaded inside the 26 gauge. So we designed this suture uh, especially for this technique actually because there was nothing available. There was 10 0 and 9 0. We wanted a bigger suture. So now we have two, the suture passing from one end to the other end, bisecting the eye into two halves. 
using the simco as an ic maintainer and google and soup the suture is exteriorized now we have a loop which is outside the tunnel so i cut the sutures so that we have two ends of the suture so the right side of the suture is passed through the dialing hole of either uh, we can use a three piece uh, pmma in trotler lens or a single piece pmma in trotler lens once the suture is passed using a portable low power cautery the flange is created the ideal size of the flange is that it just uh, should be larger than the uh, dialing hole similarly on the other side the suture is passed through the other dialing hole and then using the same low power cautery a flange larger than the uh, dialing hole is done <clears throat> so the tip here is uh, make sure the suture and the uh, cautery are not in contact because when it comes in contact you have sharp edges and using the simco as an ac maintainer the io oil is pushed inside while pushing inside you can pull the suture so that the io oil is taut and it doesn't go posteriorly and gently the io oil is placed inside so now the centration is uh, done by you know pulling the suture on either side the io oil is a little bit decentered to the first uh, site of flanging and the suture is held close to the sclera and it is trimmed to about 3 mm and using the same portable cautery a flange is created so once the flange is created you pull the suture on the other side and the surrounding conjunctiva it is very important that the flange should be buried below the tenons as well it shouldn't go just subconjunctively it should go below the tenons and plug the sclerotomy site and the other side is usually i prefer to keep it at the site of my tunnel either on the left or right side and it is, and the suture is held closely and the flange is done the anterior chamber is hydrated using bss and the conjunctiva is cauterized at the end of surgery i prefer to use uh, oromox uh, moxifloc intracameral moxifloxacin so this is the surgery and um, so there was a lot of people asked is it stable is it stable this is similar to the old uh, sutured sfi oil where we had a specially designed uh, io oils where the haptics had holes in them so we had two sutures on the haptics and two sutures on the sclera this is similar to the but no knots in it instead we flange to keep the io oil stable so we've done over 100 cases in the past 10 months now we are uh, yet to publish it we are writing it uh, it's almost going for publication so the, here are a few uh, pictures of uh, the surgeries we have done it as both primary and secondary so microsphere of a case where uh, fake was attempted but the bag got uh, caught in the probe so we had to change it to a, a scleral fixated lens and then uh, this is an fake patient uh, referred to us and we managed to do an as a file this is the pictures are all post operative one day pictures this is a traumatic anterior subluxation and this is the pod one picture and uh, we have uh, so gross pseudo exfoliation cases where the bag and uh, ctr complex is uh, dislocated and fibros capsule so we've done this in uh, those kind of cases as well uh, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity thanks dr vivekananda that was a very elegantly done surgery but uh, just referring to the original uh, tenor brow uh, technique he has created one uh, a long tunnel which goes at an angle and then enters and uh, so i thought maybe that would make it uh, give allow the the you know uh, the drop the the track which is there which will prevent the uh, suture um, from so, um, yes madam so that's the uh, part uh, with the conjunctiva madam so i make sure to move the conjunctiva at least by 1 to 2 mm yeah. so i loosen the conjunctiva move it and make the paracentesis so at the end of surgery it totally covers and the most important tip is madam only when there are sharp edges on the flange it tears the conjunctiva so the yeah. trick is not to touch the suture and the cautery so when you don't touch it it's a very rounded mushroom and uh, 10 months post op yeah. we've seen madam and over 100 cases we are uh, we've done so far fantastic uh, results madam and uh, the difference between the canabrava technique and our technique is canabrava uses a specially designed intracular lens where the haptics have eyelets yeah and uh, that is one difference we use regular pmma lenses or uh, this is widely available in all the african countries and in uh, asian country so it is very easy for us and it's easy for anterior segment surgeons and the other uh, new invention uh, innovation in this technique is the process of threading the suture to the 26 gauge needle making the sclerotomy so you have to do that twice on either side and exteriorize the suture which at least takes 20 minutes to do madam that one step because the suture will go inside it's very yeah. difficult to exterior so we designed this suture 
material with a long needle so that it gets over in less than a minute you can pass the suture and bring it out the you entire surgery it is better than the 70 proline which you use we've tried all sutures madam we've tried uh, 50 50 is a little stouter madam 60 yeah. and 70 are good better than 50 that's what we feel uh, the smaller sutures have no strength actually it yeah. is better uh, the best of the lot was uh, Uh, seven. We did a few trials with all the sizes, and then we zeroed in on uh, the seven zero suit. So this needle is uh, making the process much much uh, simpler. Actually, uh, we had a little bit of learning curve, and now uh, we kind of uh, have a proper technique. And it takes if once the tunnel and the uh, vitrectomy is done, it takes five minutes to complete the surgery. So it's uh, very, and we've done it in clear corneal incisions also. so what we've done is we've taken the acrylic lenses uh, I, i i don't have the video with me right now and uh, at the optic haptic junction site where the uh, either a single piece or a three piece acrylic lens you can uh, puncture it using a 26 gauge needle pass the suture flange it and then load it in a 3.2 mm cartridge so that uh, there is uh. there's no breakage of the suture uh, so uh, the same similar fashion first you do the pars plana puncture externalize the suture cut it passes through pa- pass through the optic flange it load it inject it and uh, the same step can be done that will take a little bit of time compared to the uh, rigid lens uh, how do you prevent uh, assure that there is no uh, congenital exposure of that knot that uh... yes madam the first point is moving the congenital away before mm-hmm. making the yeah. so and one sclerotomy is always transconjunctival and the other one is at the site where i do the peritomy okay. for the tunnel so this way one conjunctiva uh, it the centration is better when we try to do both trans conjunctively sometimes it is a little decentered but the iol uh, is stable the refractive correction is not there but it's not well centered so when we chose to have one in the site of the tunnel where the sclera is exposed we had proper centration and uh, like i said madam moving the conjunctiva and not touching the uh, suture with the cautery tip Uh, helps in having a rounded flange and uh, total coverage of the uh, sclerotomy site at the end of surgery thank you very much any uh, thing just one question uh, yeah. since you have done excellent surgery and very clean yeah. and neat yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. so just one question since you have done such large numbers have you yeah. compared not only decentration but also tilt with the glued iol and with the uh, cmt flex <coughs> um we have not done a comparative study madam but uh, what we have done is uh, we've done asoct images for uh, most of the patients in high myopes it's a little difficult to get the asoct image because we are a little posterior to the uh, iris and um, we cannot get the plane the tilt is something you know if we have an intraocular uh, oct microscope then probably we can assess on table but here what we do is visibly with our naked eye when we see a tilt or uh, you know if it is tilted if it is flat so when we pull both the sutures and bring the iol to the center we get an uh, rough idea so what we do is we increase the uh, spherical power by 0.5 diopters in such cases so in over the uh, in a more, in almost 90% of the cases we didn't have any spherical correction we did have cylindrical correction but it was not too high not too high we had a maximum up to 1.25 diopters of uh, cylindrical correction post operatively but mostly uh, the correction was very minimal but obviously for for, a, for an aphakic patient i think uh, you know uh, Uh, the patients were happy basically can i can i make one point any 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 yeah. dislocation or sir, any cut through of you sir yes sir we had uh, three cases of uh, i uh, the flange dislocating mm. and uh, what we uh, understood what i understood by that is when we try to suture when we try to flange or stretch the uh, suture too much and flange it it just pops inside when you form the anterior chamber we had it intraoperatively so at the end of surgery when you form the anterior chamber when the eye is expanding even more the flange runs inside so the the flange shouldn't be the suture shouldn't pull the iol too, too tightly or too loose it has to be and one uh, important concern when we first attempted this was there will be wobbling of the intraocular lens uh, post operatively uh, but uh, there is no wobble sir you don't see any movement on the intraocular lens at all post operatively can i make one point uh, first of all excellent video dr vivekanandan but i have Thank a concern you. see we shifted from sutured sfil to intraocular fixation because of the concern with endophthalmogenesis because there are two hinges one at sclera and one at the optic and your suture junction with movement of the eye the to and fro movement of the iol complex is too much that could increase the risk of retinal uh, complications that was one concern 
So did you notice any retinal complication in your 100 patient series? The second, uh, uh, see, when you are uh, doing pottery in a suture, it's just like when you do a do when you burn plastic, it becomes more bolus, but the strength is not as a normal plastic. Similarly, suture, if you do cautery, the the blob that we are forming, it is it doesn't have the same strength as the original suture. So there is definitely potential risk in future. It may erode or it may the, the aisle may one haptic make uh, one suture may go in. And lastly, your first clinical photo shows that the knot was quite visible subconjunctively, which Dr. Chitra highlighted also. Conjunctiva doesn't give you a full protection or full barrier of bacteria. So is there any potential risk of increased risk of endothelmitis with this technique? He has not had it. So, so. so far, we have not had it, madam. Uh, so one thing we are very particular is moving the conjunctiva and not touching the suture, like I said earlier. The other thing is, if there is, we've had cases where the we touch in the initial days and there was a sharp uh, point at the flange end, which kind of eroded and came out. And then we went back, we did a peritomy, we did the flange and then sutured the conjunctiva. That is one case. But so far, it's been fine, madam. And it is similar to any other SFI oil where you're externalizing the haptic. Instead of externalizing the haptic, we are bringing the suture out. So it's not uh, that big a difference. And uh, we've tried uh, in the wet lab to, you know, pluck the flange out of the suture and uh, it's not that easy. So uh, I'm not sure, you know, a knot can uh, definitely disintegrate over time, but uh, this doesn't feel like that. Matter. So far, we've had good results. Uh, I think we have to wait much longer to see how it is because Yamane has published uh, flanging of the haptic uh, series of 100 cases. Uh, the outcomes are good. Uh, so this is also has been good so far. So I think uh, I'm going to conclude this uh, session. It's been a very exhausting three hours for, I'm sure for the expert panel and for us and for all of you, it was an enormous variety and I'm sure three hours, none of us thought of anything else but ophthalmology. So I really my, express my very, very special thanks to every single expert panel, uh, Dr. Sandeep Nagvekar, Dr. Purendra Basin, Dr. Inder Mohan Rustagi, and last minute, Shreesh taking helping to uh, be the fourth expert panel. Each and every one of you was so intensely involved and so along with us. I don't know how to thank you for what you did. And uh, thanks a lot, Anagha, for being a great moderator for me in the session. Thank you so much, uh, dear uh, uh, all of you uh, speakers for superb videos each of you showed. I think it has been an immense learning curve for us, learning uh, process for us. I would like to you take this opportunity to thank some of my dear ARC members who are not here, but have always been solid supports for us to take forward these webinars. I would have to thank AIOS admin uh, led by Mr. Kripal for being so supportive and the SMSs which reach all our uh, delegates before the meetings. I would want to thank Sai and Manjula from Neurotech for all those mailers which raid your inboxes so often. My very special thanks to Mr. Sunil. You can see how he's there, a non-ophthalmologist at that, constantly with us in the three hours and he's so supportive to us. And very soon he would be sharing the numbers of people who watch. Believe me, uh, without much effort, easily 400, 500, 600 people watch these webinars. And I'm sure these webinars, then they are watched over the period of time. It goes to thousands of them who watch, especially the younger uh, population. So thank you so much, one and all of you. Of course, I have to thank the delegates who are watching. It is you who encourages us, ARC, all the time, not to go all the time physical, but to hold on to these webinars also. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Parul. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Dr. Sandeep. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chitra. I, Dr. I, I, I made a very big mistake. I did not show the, if you could wait for a minute, I want that Entoad video to play. I did not uh, thank Entoad. They have been amazing sponsors for every single webinar of us. Mr. Sunil, can you please play this Entoad video? Without a complaint, they're always there to back us up and kudos to them for being such major support systems for us. Yes, could you play the video?
Thank you very much. Thank you, one and all of you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Bye bye.